At this time, I will reconvene into open session this meeting of the Arlington Independent School District Board of Trustees for January 13th, 2022, beginning at 7 o'clock sharp p.m. on time. Due to health and safety concerns related to the COVID-19 coronavirus, members of the public are encouraged to participate by watching the school board meeting online at www.aisd.net. One or more trustee may participate in this meeting via video conference call. A quorum of the Board of Trustees will be physically present at the administration building. Members of the public may access this meeting via AISD website at www.aisd.net. Thank you all for joining us tonight and Happy New Year. Our board meetings are open to the public and we welcome everyone and thank you for participating in public education. While our meetings are open to the public, this is a meeting and we have business to conduct, so disruptions will not be permitted. Anyone who disrupts the meeting or speaks when others are speaking may be asked to leave or be escorted out by the security attending the meeting. We welcome civic input, but we insist that we remain respectful and civil. Thank you for your cooperation. So we will start our meeting with the opening ceremony. Please join Mr. Chapa in leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Please silence all cell phones and electronic devices to avoid any disruptions to those around you. And now, if you would please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, the first item on our agenda is our program and our presentation, which will be given by the student performance by the All Region Junior High Orchestra. Ms. Anita Foster, please. Greetings, President Mays, members of the board, Dr. Cavazos, everyone here in person and everyone watching online. When I walked in tonight and this group was rehearsing, I really thought we had invited a high school performance, perhaps guests from UT Arlington. And then I read the copy and said, oh my gosh, they're junior high school. You're really gonna be blown away. This is a combination of students from our junior high schools across the Arlington ISD. They earn their seats in the Texas Music Educators Association Region 5 Junior High Middle School Symphony Orchestra. They earn these seats through competitive auditions across Arlington, Grand Prairie, Mansfield, Fort Worth, and they competed against over 400 students to get these coveted seats. So we're really, really proud of them. They recently participated in the Region Clinic concert where they joined together and they prepared a full concert, which was absolutely fantastic. So tonight they're gonna perform one of those numbers for you, Flower Duet. It was arranged by Albert Wang, conducted by Young Junior High Head Orchestra Director, Luann Greer. Congratulations everyone on your seats and take it away.
Amazing. Thank y'all so much. And congratulations. very nice. Testing one, two. <laughs> Thank you, Frank, for all you do. Okay, so we will move to our next program on the agenda, and that is our Student of the Month. So for January, our Student of the Month is coming from Lamar High School. So I will turn it over to Principal Andy Hagman to do the introduction. He's doing what he does best, yeah. <laughs> engaging with the students. <laughs> Please, this is Kennedy me Johnson. Principal Lamar High School, Mr. Andy Hagman. Good evening. Sorry, we were uh, taking pictures for Instagram. So that's certainly more important than any kind of thing we're going to be talking about. Uh, thank you for having us tonight, Dr. Cavazos, members of the board. Appreciate it very much. Um, our student of the month is Lillian Graham. She is a senior. And I asked faculty members to give me suggestions for who do you think uh, would be a good representative for us that is very involved in the school, very much making the most of the opportunity that opportunities that we provide. And from a number of people, I got Lillian's name. Lillian is that kid that she's not front of the cheer squad, she's not gonna be in the forefront, but she is a worker bee everywhere. She is in orchestra, she is in color guard and winter guard, she is in dance, and she is on the yearbook staff, and she makes tremendous grades and takes advantage of advanced courses as well. All of that activity while dealing with uh, the daily challenge of diabetes, um, which is a struggle, it's a challenge for her, but always a smile, always pleasant, always cheerful, and always does fantastically in everything that she undertakes. So Lillian is just an extraordinary example 
of what Lamar High School has to offer, and we're so, so proud of her. Thank you so much. This is Lillian. Hi, Hi Lillian, congratulations. Thank you. How are um, you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Feel free to take a few moments to say a few words, introduce anyone that may be here with you. Um, I have my mom and my dad here. Hi, Mom and Dad. Hello. They've always been really supportive of the things that I do here and the things that I spend my time with. And I've made a lot of great friends at Lamar, and I love doing what I do. And I've made a lot of good memories. Very good. Thank you. Well, congratulations, Lillian. Dr. Cavazos and I are going to come down and present something with you and take a picture with you. Uh, but I just want to say congratulations and the way Mr. Hagman described all the things that you do in the background. What's interesting is don't forget that people are still watching you. You don't have to be in the front. So what an inspiration and an example you really are showing. So thank you for representing not only Lamar High School but Arlington ISD. Thank you. I actually had to take her out of practice tonight too because I may have not done the best job of communicating on time. And so we got popped right out of winter guard practice and here we are. So. Hello, testing. Thank you, Frank. Lillian, what we have to present to you this evening is a pin from the school board, something for you to wear that we give to those that have been a great example for Arlington ISD. Want you to have this pin from us, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, and Lillian, congratulations. You represent our students exceptionally well. Uh, we're very fortunate to have you in our school system. I wish you the very best, and you, you deserve this, so this is for you as well. Okay, the next presentation on our agenda is the Martin Luther King Celebration Art and Essay Winners. Miss Anita Foster, please. Yes, thank you, President Mays. Members of the board, Dr. Cavazos, unfortunately, we had to postpone this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration, but we are not gonna postpone the excitement around it. Uh, we have a special guest tonight, Pastor Kennedy Jones, President of the Arlington Ministerial Association and Chairman of the 2022 Advancing the Dream Celebration is here tonight to recognize our artists and our essay winners. Come on up. Thank you. President May, this distinguished board is uh, an honor to appear before you, especially to present these winners uh, and the great work they have done. In art, our third place winner was Alexi Alvarez from Bowie High School. And if you, if you could stand. And our second place winner is Haley Townsend from Arlington High School. And our first place winner 
is Keith Johnson from Martin High School. Yeah, it looks like we've got Keith on the screen here. Okay, wonderful. And we want to thank each of them for entering and for uh, accomplishing uh, this feat in the, the work that they have done. It's not something you do in a minute, but they did some really great work, and the, the artwork was, was outstanding. Our essay winners, you may be seated. Our essay winners. Third place winner was John Paul Brawlow from Seguin High School. Second place winner was Janae Brown from Sam Houston. And our first place winner was Lamaya Battle from Seguin High School. And again, we want to thank them for participating and for the great work that, that they did in accomplishing uh, this goal. We thank you. And then we want to take a moment to thank the um, Arlington AISD and to uh, let you know that we have not postponed, we have uh, not canceled, but we have postponed the uh, MLK four day celebration events until later in February or maybe as late as in April. Time and the health conditions permitting, we will carry on this work because the work of the man is more important than just a holiday. Thank you. So thank you, Pastor Jones. Congratulations to our art and our essay winners. Thank y'all very much for participating, doing things outside of your regular school day that you feel are important to you and, and being able to be recognized for that I think is very important. So congratulations again. Um, Pastor Jones or Anita, is there any way that the board can maybe receive copies of the essay so we can read them? We can make that happen. Thank you, thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is a presentation for school board recognition presentation. Mrs. Foster. Before uh, we introduce our guests tonight, on behalf of all of the staff at the Arlington ISD, we want to thank you, school board. It's school board recognition month. You guys do so much every day as volunteers, and I don't know that a lot of people know that. I think it's important that people know your commitment of time, your energy, your brain power, your love, it's apparent to all of us, and we just want to say thank you. We do have a presentation tonight, uh, and this year's theme for School Board Appreciation Month is Rising Above. Very, very fitting. Every year, students from the district create pieces of art, and they present them to you to say thank you on our behalf for all that you do for students and for staff, parents, and the community. So tonight, Ms. Joni Rinker Dozier's class, uh, is the, they are the artists that will be presenting the artwork tonight. Uh, Mrs. Dozier is at Owsley Junior High in the Visual Arts Department. Ms. Dozier, please come on up. Let's introduce your students and present the art. My heart rate just got a little faster. <laughs> All right, good evening, President Mays, Dr. Cavazos, and board members. My name's Joni Rinker Dozier, and I'm an art teacher at Owsley Junior High. I've been teaching at Owsley for the past 25 years since its inception, room 410. <laughs> I'd like to start by thanking my family, uh, my friends, my administration at Owsley for their encouragement and support of the fine arts. I truly appreciate it. I'd also to, like to thank the district for your valued vision um, and support for fine arts. Truly amazing. This district is extraordinary when it comes to fine arts and I truly thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> All right, speaking of extraordinary, this school board has risen above tirelessly during the past year and a half during this pandemic as well, navigating through controversial topics, strategic plans, creating budgets, adopting policies, all handled with professionalism. <laughs> Excuse me. 
All right, and as we know, January is School Board Recognition Month. We would like to thank all of you for being dedicated volunteers. We appreciate all of the time and energy that you have put in on behalf of our children. Teachers, schools, community, all geared towards student success. Tonight, we say thank you to each of you, <coughs> excuse me, for rising above and volunteering, voluntarily being advocates for our students, teachers, schools, and community. My glasses are... <laughs> All right, my students had the honor to create for you an artwork visually representing what they meant, what meant to them to rise above given the enormous obstacles and situations this past year and a half. They have created for you their version of rising above and overcoming challenges. I am so proud of their work that they have created for you. I would like to introduce to you a few artists that you volunteer your time for endlessly from Owsley and thank you for rising above. Okay, my, my first student, Meshach, <clears throat> he was unable to make it, but this is for Mr. Chapa. <laughs> Meshach's eighth grade goal is to pass eighth grade with A and B honor roll, and when he grows up, he wants to be an NFL player. <laughs> so here's yours. Okay, Justin, Jen. can you stay down there? And then at the end, we, we want to take pictures if we can, including with Demas Dozier. Thanks. <laughs> can you hold it up at the camera? Okay. <laughs> okay, Jennifer Udo. Jennifer's eighth grade goal is to enjoy eighth grade year and to get into collegiate high school. When she grows up, she wants to be a really good surgeon. <laughs> And this is for McCullough. I'm sorry. Sarah McMurrow. McMurrow. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. What's that? Sure. Yeah. She's going to come down. Yeah, you can turn it around. Okay. I'm sorry, Sarah. I know I met you. <laughs> I don't know. Did they stay up here? Too? Yes, please. Stay, stay, yes. Stay next to your person. Yes. Okay, Adrian Rubio Gonzalez and Dr. Cavazos. Okay, Adrian's eighth grade goal is to pass with all A's and pass all the star tests. When he grows up, he wants to be an artist. He's a really good one. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? As for a superintendent, <laughs> you are an artist. <laughs> okay, I have Carolyn Wynn next. And President Mays. Okay, Carolyn uh, would like to pass all her classes with high grades, is her eighth grade goal. And when she grows up, she wants to be an artist. Oh, you're already an artist. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. And Samantha Redell. Okay, Samantha's eighth grade goal is to not get too stressed out about grades. And when she grows up, she wants to be an architect. Lincoln. Excel's eighth grade goal is to enjoy being a kid. And when she grows up, she wants to own her own bakery or restaurant. Oh, 
Yes. And Abby, her Tarzan, her eighth grade goal is to keep healthy relationships. And when she grows up, she wants to be a pediatrician or an OBGYN. And Kathy Ramirez. Her eighth grade goal is to become a better at things that she enjoys, like art. And when she grows up, she wants to be a medical examiner. <laughs> I can speak in front of kids all day, but <laughs> it's a little small. Okay, Spence, can you come and take a picture? Ms. Doja, I would like for you to be included as well. Okay, so um, first of all, just speaking for the board, thank you very much for that recognition. Very much appreciated, very thoughtful. And I do just have to say, everybody in my job, in my office, I have every single painting that I've ever been presented as I've served as trustee on my wall, filling in my office. And every time I look at it, it just brings me so much joy and just reminds me of why we do what we do. Okay, next on our agenda, is our appointments, our administrative ratifications and appointments. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mays, and I'd like to recommend that the board ratify the appointments of the individuals discussed in closed session for assistant principal for Johns Elementary and assistant principal for Larson Elementary. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the administrative ratification as discussed in executive session? Move for approval. Do you have a second? Okay. 
Motion by Mr. Hogg, a second by Mrs. Fowler. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. All present voted in the affirmative, unanimous passing. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Mays, and I'd like to introduce our new assistant principal for Johns Elementary. This is a ratification, so they, she has been working already, but it's Flor Flores. And Flor comes uh, as a campus testing facilitator most recently at Wimbish, has been a kindergarten bilingual teacher, a kindergarten bilingual uh, teacher at Morton, and you see her uh, information there. She went to UT Arlington for Bachelor of Arts and UT Arlington for Master of Education. Congratulations to Flor Flores. Next, the assistant principal for Larson Elementary is Bradley Pennington. Bradley attended UT Tyler for Bachelor of Science and UT Tyler for Master of Education, as you see there. Uh, most recently, our AVID coordinator at Nichols Junior High and has taught the career uh, CTHI class and has been an AVID tutor. Congratulations to Bradley as well. That concludes our appointments. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. Next in our agenda is our Texas Academic Performance Report, the public hearing. Thank you, President Mason. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Natalie, Dr. Natalie Lopez. Uh, there you go. Uh, that will lead us through this uh, presentation of our uh, TAPRA report. Dr. Lopez. Uh, President Mays, members of the board, Dr. Cavazos, thank you for your time. Um, I'm reviewing the results of our 2020-2021 uh, Texas Academic Performance Report. Um, this is an annual report, as you know, and much of what you will see we have already gone through in uh, prior board meetings and presentations, so I will uh, move swiftly and hit highlights. So. The Texas Academic Performance Report is, uh, describes educational performance of our district and the campuses within the district. It's intended to inform the public of our academic standing, again, of the district and then of the campuses compared to the district, to the state, and to comparable um, schools. Now, Arlington is large, um, and the report that we get is over a thousand pages long, so I'm going to keep it to the district level. Um, the, all the campus reports and our district TAPA report are available on the website. So looking at our um, TAPA measures, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not moving. I was moving with my pages and not with the report, the uh, presentation, I apologize. Um, looking at the TAPA measures, uh, we have performance, participation, attendance, graduation and dropout rates, college career and military readiness, student information, and staff information. Now, before we review those measures specifically, I wanna provide y'all with some information on how those um, impact accountability. So, um, as due to the impact of COVID-19, TEA did not issue um, A to F accountability ratings for the 2020-21 school year. Um, all districts and campuses were uh, rated, labeled, labeled not rated, um, declared state of disaster for 2020. One. However, um, it remains critical for you know, parents, students, policymakers, legislatures, administrators to understand uh, academic standing of students. And so um, we continued on with our annual end of year assessments. So we were able to give uh, the STAR, the STAR Alt 2, TELPASS, and the TELPASS alternate test. One note. Um, to look forward to accountability upcoming is that as required by the Senate Bill 1365, academic accountability ratings will be limited to A, B, C, or not rated. Um, districts and campuses are not going to be receiving D or F ratings this upcoming accountability year. So even, what that means is like even if mathematically they fall into a D or F category, they're not going to receive a D or F rating, they'll get not rated. So. Moving back to our 2021 uh, accountability rating, uh, we were not rated, no one was rated. Not only were, um, was the district not rated, but we received incomplete raw score um, data because the domains couldn't be calculated in the same way. We did not receive any scaled score um, information for the domains, so nothing that we can, um, nothing that we can use to determine a, a rating no distinctions were given either. 
So um, I'm going to move into the actual performance portion of uh, the tapper and um, for this, normally the tapper report does your current year and then the prior year. Well, we didn't have um, STAR or EOC tests in 2020, so what's included in this year's tapper is actually looking back two years to 2019. So I'll report out on all subjects first, and this is at the approaches grade level standard. That's a satisfactory passing standard. So um, for 2021, we have a 58%. That's down 16 uh, from 74% in 2019. Um, that drop uh, can be seen across all of the subgroups that are reported out there. You have African American, Hispanic, White, American Indian, Asian, Pacific Islander, two or more races, special education, economically disadvantaged, and ELL, and those all um, show that same decrease. For uh, reading, for 2021, we are at 61%. That's down nine from the 2019's 70%. Reading had the, the smallest decrease um, of the subject areas. However, it was shown across all of the subgroups. For math, we were at 53% in 2021, down 25% uh, from the 2019 78%. Um, this subject area has the largest decrease of all of our subjects. Um, and that one also is seen across all of our subgroups. For writing for 2021, uh, we're at 47%. That's a decrease of 16% from 2019, 63%. For writing, the decreases across all of the subgroups. Um, might see that, for example, Pacific Islander is down 37%. That seems much larger than uh, the all student category. However, um, with some of our smaller subgroups like that, the, um, that's not really attributed to anything other than the fact that it's a small number. So when you have small numbers, it's easier for them to fluctuate one way or another. And so I, I don't think any particular attention needs to be paid to the subgroup. But I just wanted to point out that if you see something like that with those smaller groups, that, uh, that's the reason why most of the time. For science, um, 2021, we're at 60%. That's down 17% from 2019's 77%. And science is down um, across all of the subgroups, of course, with the exception of that Pacific Islander group, which actually shows an increase. I wouldn't think there's anything there other than that, that something that can be attributed to the small number of that group. And for social studies, uh, we are at 68%, down 11% from our 2019 value of 79. And that is across the board for all of our subgroups, um, with the exception of two or more races, which just maintained. However, again, that two or more races is a small category. And so I don't uh, see any need to look into that for anything uh, in particular. Now, um, what the last subgroup on the last couple of slides were ELL, and that's our English language learners. That's actually uh, comprised of students that receive bilingual services and then ESL services. So um, those have been split out. And um, since we're just looking at the bilingual uh, subgroup uh, in particular, I'm showing all the, um, all the subjects on the one slide here. So what you can see for our 2021 results for the all subjects for bilingual, it's at 42%, and that is down 27. Reading is at 46%, that is down 20. Math is 44% down 34. Writing is at 27%, that was down 33. And then science is at 33%, um, which was down 19%. Now for um, ESL, for uh, 2021, the all subject group is 46%. That is down overall from 2019 from 15%. Now, reading is 49%, and that's down 4. Math is 46%, and that's down 27. Um, writing is 37%, down 14. Science is 49, down 14. And social studies is 42, and that is also down 14. Um, interestingly, this group um, in the ELL category, but it seems like it has less of a decrease than the bilingual, um, might be due to the fact that the ESL services are received up through high school. and um, 
you know, we didn't see as much in particular, if you look at reading, it's only down 4%. We didn't see as much of a drop in English 1 or English 2 scores across the state. And so that might be for the reason why there's less of an impact on the ESL versus the bilingual, which stops um, in those uh, elementary grades. Moving into participation, um, ESSA participation requirements um, hold for, uh, actually this, this slide should be updated, it says requirement is still 95%, so it's not so much that the, the uh, requirement was waived as much that it was, wasn't calculated um, in our accountability rating. So um, the state of Texas was at 88% um, participation for the students, AISD was at 86%. Um, so even though both the district and the state are under that 95% requirement, um, it didn't have the impact, and so uh, no scores were calculated. It didn't uh, do anything to ratings. Um, what will typically happen, though, um, in a regular year is if you're under the 95% requirement, then you, um, the TA sort of puts in these false failure, uh, this false failure idea, and I don't think they're called that uh, anymore, but it's that concept where they'll put in failing scores um, up till you reach the requirement of the 95%. So um, we were only at 86% last year. We wanna make sure that things look like they're going as they are, that we hit the 95% participation this year. Um, I'll move into uh, attendance rate. And so um, performance and participation is from prior spring, so 2021, but attendance is from um, the looks at the difference from the 2019 and the 2020 school year. So um, our 2020 uh, attendance had an increase, 97.6% um, in the all student category, which is a gain of 2.6 from our 95% in 2019. And those attendance rates are up um, kind of right around that one to 3% across all of the subgroups. The four-year graduation rate, like attendance, looks at um, two years back, so this is 2019 and, and 2020. Um, our graduation rates increased for our 2020, for, they're at 90.5, that's an increase of 2.6% from uh, 2019's 87.9%. And almost across the board, all the subgroups um, had that reflect that increase. Again, that Pacific Islander category that has that small number, that's the only one that's different than the other subgroups. Um, there were efforts prior to COVID for moving towards graduation, um, in addition to maybe some of that uh, COVID grace uh, that might be account for that increase, but uh, nobody really to determine uh, specifically. The uh, inverse of the graduation is the, is the dropout rate. So what you see here is that in 2020, it was at 6.4%. That's down 1.6% from the rate in 2019, which was at eight. And so uh, that makes sense. The graduation was up, dropout was down, and uh, dropout stayed down for all the subgroups, of course, with the exception of that Pacific Islander. We, um, also, even if students don't graduate in that traditional four years, uh, try to get them to graduate regardless. And so we have uh, five-year graduation rates. Those are from uh, the cohorts in 2018 and 2019. And so uh, there is an increase in the 2019 of 91.1%, and that's up a half a percent from what it was for that 2018 cohort, which was at 90.6%. And you know, being at only a difference of um, a half a percent being so close to zero, you see that some of the subgroups fall above zero, some fall below, so not, not really um, any consistent trend across the, the subgroups on that. But it does align with our five-year dropout rates, um, which for the all-student group were decreased of uh, negative 0.7%, uh, so 7.8% for 2019, and it was at 8.5% for uh, 2018. I'll move into the student data portion. Um, our total students in membership are 56,783. I uh, do have a bit of a drop there from the prior year. The state um, shows 5,359,040. Um, the state also experienced a drop um, of, of their students. The um, ethnic distribution um, for our district is, it, it's, we're a diverse school uh, district and um, 
it doesn't exactly align to the state, but it's very similar. I'll go into the specific percentages on the next slide. Um, go to skip down onto the economically disadvantaged category there. So we're at 74.3%, whereas the state is at 60.3. So we are above the state on economically disadvantaged. Um, we are up in eco dis for, um, from the prior year, which I believe was 72.1. Our English language learners are at 29.6%, also higher than the state, which is 20.7%. Now the ECODIS and the ELL, they um, have a relationship, they fall into the at-risk category amongst other things. And so our at-risk is 59.7. That makes sense that that would be larger than the state's, which is 49.2, given that our ECODIS and our, our ELLs are higher than the state. So. Now looking at the student ethnic distribution, uh, our largest student group are our Hispanic students at 47.1%, followed by our African American students at 25.8%. Um, white students are 17.9% of our population. Asian is 5.8%. And then we have a very small slice of the pie of our other subgroups. And in that, um, we have two or more races at 2.8%, American Indian at a half a percent, and Pacific Islander at 0.2%. Our staff data um, shows that our total staff in the district was 8,168 employees, obviously under the state, which was 745,316. Um, an area here to look at, our teachers was 50.4% of our staff. Uh, that is just slightly higher than the state, which was 49.6, but our teachers make up about half of our, uh, our staff. And then our central administration is only a half of a percent, which it's a half of a percent, and it's half of what the state's uh, percentage is. And so we're, we're not top heavy. We have um, more teachers than, um, than the state as far as percentages go and less administration. Our student per teacher ratio is 13.8, uh, lower than the states, which is 14.5. And our instructional staff percentage um, is 64.3. That's also lower than the state, which is 64.6. I mean, slightly lower. I wouldn't, nothing significant there. But um, that instructional staff percentage is, is just a measure of time. So the number of time, uh, total hours spent on instruction over the total number of hours worked by everybody in the district. And so um, kind of right there with the state there. Moving into our operating expenditure values from all funds, our total operating expenditures per student in the district are 10,064, a um, little lower than the state's, 10,406. Um, for instruction, kind of right, right there, neck and neck, 5,890 for instruction per student, um, which, whereas the state is 5,929. I won't go through, i let you kind of look through the rest of those categories for the all funds. Um, however, general administration is almost half of uh, what it is for the state, 195 compared to the 335 for the state. And then this next view just shows those operating expenditures in percentages um, instead of in values. And so you can just kind of see uh, there, there is some slight differences uh, from what, what is happening in our district to, um, to the state. So the last part of our financial data is our instructional expenditure ratio um, from our all funds. And for the district, that's 63%. For the state of Texas, it's 63.8, just slightly under that. And our unassigned general fund balance um, as a percentage of the budget, that is 37.1%. Uh, for the state, it's 27.2. There are links to the actual um, type of report and then the financial um, slides that were at the end. Uh, available in the PowerPoint. I do believe you guys also have the paper copy. And that is what I have for you today. So I'll go ahead and stop there and let y'all ask questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez. Um, do I have any trustees with questions? Mrs. Fowler? Thank you, President Mays. Very thorough report. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had one question on the slide about participation. Yes, ma'am. Could that be, I know that there were a lot of issues with um, um, STAR not working on the computer and various things like that, power outages and just all kinds of, of things that were going on. Could, could that account for any of the participation with the drop? 
So um, the issues that were related to any technology were addressed quickly. Um, and from what I know, that was not throughout the entirety of the test. Um, without knowing specifically which students were impacted, I can't speak 100% confidently to whether that impacted that individual level student participation. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, it if they had an issue with technology, they had opportunity and time to hop on and take it again. Um, and campuses were, technology was quick to respond to that and campuses were quick to respond. And I think did, had really good efforts at getting those students back on and, um, and tested. But I can't, uh, can't speak 100% for each individual student. So, but overall, I would say I don't think that that is a main driver for participation being under. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fowler. Mr. Chapa. Thank you, President Mays. I just had uh, one question, and that is, do you have a sense of how our academic performance reflected in these co reports compares to other districts that are similarly situated with us throughout the state? We do, um, and we had done some analyses where we looked at our our percentile ranking based on our scores um, by subject and it, we did have more of well, we did drop in our percentile rank as compared to where we were in prior years okay would you say that it was it, it was a because i know so many districts have been um have had similar issues with pretty severe sharp drops in performance mm -hmm. because of the COVID year, and this is what this represents. Mm -hmm. And so I just, it, it, is it a sense that we're in line with that um, in the same ballpark, or is it, or are we noticeably different in any particular area? You know, based on the percentile rank, we had more of a drop. Um, the There were other factors that go into that, however, uh, we had a lower participation than the districts that we typically compare ourselves to, um, kind of overall. And so without really knowing how those students uh, performed, I can't really, s I can't give you the full picture. But yeah. in the percentile ranks that we did with the data that we had, yes, we did experience a drop that um, just s seemed larger than uh, those that we normally compare to. Right, and it's sort of, I mean, it's sort of a wonky deal where it's not historically in line with what our practices are around STAR, where almost every single kid takes it because yep. we're in person. And there were, you know, students who were at home didn't have to come in to take it. And it was pretty widely publicized, and I suspect a bunch of the students knew that it didn't count. Um, and so I just know that yeah. there's so many of these confounding variables at play that, um, that seem to have affected other districts across the state that we know we have work to do, um, and this reflects that, but you know, I think it's going to be, the, we're gonna need a couple of years, if not, we don't get it this year, because who knows what's gonna happen with STAR this year, um, to be able to see where we really are, mm -hmm. because these this data comes from such a unusual year and an unusual situation. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Mr. Wilbanks. Thank you, President Mays, and um, thank you, Dr. L Lopez. Um, I guess, you know, there are some bright, bright spots. Number one, as you pointed out, the uh, graduation rates and the dropout rates are better than expected, um, just a little bit. But, you know, given such a difficult year and what we've heard with students across the country, you know, we would have expected to see a drop, and we didn't, so that's good. Um, as my colleague, Mr. Chapa, pointed out that, um, and through our conversations that we've had in the past, we know we've had a precipitous decline, especially in mathematics. And we have challenge areas, and we know um, we have work to do. I do want to stress to teachers that, you know, unfortunately this year has been just as challenging with operational um, issues, uh, especially recently with the Omicron variant, and that it is going to take time, and it is going to take multiple years, and that um, w there's a lot of anxiety around the fact that we need to catch kids up, and we will. It's just going to take time. So, you know, hopefully teachers are not feeling that extra pressure now, given 
what we're going through operationally. Um, and I had um, a few questions with things that y you had brought up earlier. Um, I didn't quite follow you on the, if you could reiter reiterate what you were talking about, since we were below the 95% uh, participation rate, how the false um, uh, failures factor in and, and, and what the net net of that. So if, if you don't have enough students participating, um, so for example, we have 86% of our students participate, what, what will happen is basically um, whatever the number needs to be, 9% uh, adding in of failing, uh, in the failing category. So however that 86% fell into the performance levels um, mm -hmm. that did not meet category will be increased to the point to where mathematically our numbers are not at 86% participation anymore, they're at 95% participation. So what it does is it, it basically says, whoever didn't participate, we're gonna make the assumption that if they did participate, they would have failed because of the requirement. Given and, and the extraordinary the circumstances of this past year, how fair is that? Well, um, this didn't impact us this year, this year because there was no ratings calculated. No scores were taken, and no ratings were given to districts. So the 95% the requirement that in prior years would have, would have hurt you and calculated, um, that didn't happen this year. So it's so, a requirement, but it didn't impact us because nothing was calculated. So in your fifth slide, when you say accountability 2022. Yes, sir based on the star if it takes place this this year that will be in effect we need to be at 95 percent yes sir we need to be at 95 mm -hmm. well, so we need to meet that requirement. Banks, and excuse me this, ahead, this yes, brings sir. up a it's a bigger issue we won't go on a tangent but it does bring up an important point the term is like forced failure uh, and that has been a concept that we have been back and forth with the agency and others about uh, not really a system to even explain, it just becomes a forced failure. So if there's a, a situation where there's an issue, there's a reason, there may be extenuating circumstances, it, it yields or defaults to a forced failure. Is mm -hmm. that right, Dr. Lopez? Yeah. And um, it affects your scores and your accountability. So forced failures in any capacity, not just this one, anything um, is always an, an issue. The other big point that Dr. Lopez has made, but I think it's worth reiterating, is that I think we had about 15% of our students not take the, the star overall. And that's an important variable that we can't calculate the effect of that, good or bad, right? Um, so I think just those two to highlight the force failures is a, is a real thing. It didn't affect this in terms of what you're seeing, but it will and mm -hmm. continue to in accountability systems. And it's, it's a continued uh, feedback that we've provided, not only our district, but other districts about um, how a default um, to that seems, maybe not just seems, is, is problematic in the sense that accurate scoring, right, accurate data is either you passed, you didn't pass, you almost passed, but to just force fail is no longer an accurate data piece, right? I mean, it just yeah. becomes a, art, artificial may not be the best word, Dr. Lopez is <laughs> more of a statistician, but, uh, but it just becomes, it, it doesn't seem It doesn't tell right. you the true picture. Yeah, yeah. So, but to her point, it's important that we continue to work to 95 and not worry about the force failure. That's the goal. But in the background from, uh, from a, a feedback to the agency and others, it's important for us to continue, not only at our level, board level, et cetera, with legislative agendas and things, uh, to continue to make that point that in any situation where you have a forced default, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's just you're losing the accuracy of your data. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you for that explanation, um, Dr. Cavazos. And kind of in line with your slide on um, accountability 2022, given my previous comments about the extreme disruption that we're seeing across the state and across the nation um, with struggles to keep campuses o open because staff out and there is dis um, continuity with instruction going on currently 
um, it sounds like we need to pressure Austin into going above and beyond uh, just the A, B, and C rating and to forego accountability this year because of the disruptions that we're seeing. Um, that would be my preference. And Mr. Wilbanks, so this is again not to go on a tangent, and it'll be appropriate also when we do our update on our goals and things, but and with a very strong public acknowledgement already from agency and others, TEA, that attendance is a, an issue across the state. Yeah. It's just, it's been disrupted, not only right now, which it really is, is obvious, but across the, the fall semester. Uh, and those variables, those factors at some point, to your point, uh, need to be uh, considered, I think, uh, statewide in terms of, okay, and at the end when there is an exam, did that have an effect? Does it have an effect? We know it does because you're missing mm -hmm. instruction. But at what level? And so to your point, uh, this is becoming very obvious, especially right now in the fourth six weeks when it's publicly acknowledged that uh, attendance, <coughs> student, staff, et cetera, for obvious reasons, uh, is a big issue in, in the state. Uh, and, and so you're, you make a good point. Yeah. Now, fortunately, from everything we, we know from this variant, the Omicron variant, that it's come on fast and it's pretty much spread everywhere and it's expected and hopefully, um, I think our uh, uh, Dr. Tanasia with the county has indicated that we think we've peaked and, for, and hopefully it will be as quickly a precipitous drop and we can get back to normality as soon as possible. But right now, it's a huge um, disruption. Um, so my final comments I want to make is to point out the obvious, and when you look at our results, and we've talked about this in previous board members, what we've seen and what we've expected about this pandemic is that it has disproportionately affected our ECHO DIS students, our ELL students, our most vulnerable students, our um, students of color, and we have heavy lifting to do. But there are bright spots, for instance, in special ed on um, all subjects, the decline was, you know, in terms of the star results, was only 8 um, percent um, overall in all subjects and only down 1 percent, where, you know, we're seeing double-digit declines in all the other sub-pops. So there are bright spots, um, but overall, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, these results are less than some of our peers in our category, and and we do have a lot of work to do. And I don't think we should dwell. We know the scope. We know the work going ahead, but we know it's going to take multiple years. And again, I'll reiterate that we don't expect this overnight. If there's any teachers listening, you know, we know it's tough right now, and we know we've got hard work to do, and we'll do whatever we can to take things off the plate, and we'll continue to push from a board level to help alleviate some of the stress and uh, symptoms or uh, stress and anxiety that we know our staff is feeling. Um, and with that said, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Wilbanks. Mrs. McMurrah. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. <laughs> I was thinking about the old microphone lean on. Okay, can we go back to the slide with the attendance rates? Thank you. Um, and I do apologize if you already specified this, but was this 2020 attendance rate reflective of before the shutdown and virtual instruction came into play, or is this just up until March? Like, when we look at 2019 versus 2020, and we see, you know, the comparison of attendance rates, how did how, how did, I guess, the pandemic play a part in that, if at all? Uh, my understanding is that it's the whole year, but I will confirm okay. and, and report back on that. Okay. And what, um, what do we think was our, you know, root cause of the attendance rate um, difference? We haven't done any analysis on that, so I can't speak um, to any reasoning that we found for that. Um, Dr. Wirtz, did you yeah, have? Well, I'll, I'll just add that, and, and Dr. Wirtz, you can, if, if, if you want to add to this, but I think what you're seeing in the attendance rate is um, the spring of 2020, um, when we shut down, 
the state did, mm -hmm. uh, there was nobody counted absent. Right. So it inflates a little bit. Is that right? Well, so that's where it's in. Oh, you yeah. might want to add, and, address and that. But I think that's what's throwing some of these numbers, especially in 2020, yeah. uh, with the attendance. But because it's a whole year. Go ahead, Steve. Right. And the other thing to think, think, keep in mind too is remember when we were trying to capture students' attendance, if you just have a contact with the teacher at that time, in any way, right. that, you're kind of present. So the, even though it wasn't necessarily representative of the fact that a student's t attendance was taken during the second period at a specific time like normal, there was so much leeway during that period which allowed us to acknowledge that a student was present, even if there was any interaction, an email, a conversation. So I can't help but believe that there was some impact that way during the March to June kind of moment. So that's what my main question was. Is that, you know, grace that we kind of that loose, mm -hmm. you know, um, attendance that we had, is that reason for to, the increase? And it's, to, to Dr. Lopez's point, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint that as the only reason. The best way we probably could do it is look at what our traditional trends have been year to year to year and notice if this is the one spike. And I don't know that off the top of my head, but that's the real big difference that happened in 2020 was those last few months. Right. It was very much a free for all. Right. Yeah. And I know that we're in the same boat right. as all districts. But um, the reason the reason why I was really curious is because I look at this and I can't help but to think about the implications for this year's attendance mm -hmm. rate. And this year is this year. It's right. not last year mm -hmm. or 2019. So um, I, uh, I just I was curious um, if you had any insight on this mm -hmm. year and how you, you predict that it might be affected? I know that's Well, it's as Dr. Cavazos indicated, uh, attendance is down. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually were looking at it across different schools, even as late as, as early as this week. Yeah. Um, I think that some of the challenges is the rules for attendance are specified this year. We take right. it as, at, the, at the recommended specific time period. So the rigidity of how attendance is taken is still being maintained, but the situation is still very much dire, like it has been before. So when you look at our attendance across the board, um, at different schools, it's worse than others, but it's just Dr. Cavazos indicates generally down. Yeah. And, and we certainly don't want to get tunnel vision with our attendance rate um, as far as numbers go, because we do not want our students um, to come to school ill. Um, we definitely have that, that line to tread as well. So um, thank you for answering those questions. Thank you, Ms. McMurrah. Um, I don't see any other colleagues with questions. Um, I just have a, a very simple question. Um, on the four-year dropout rate for 2019 and 2020 for the American Indian population, um, so for 2020 it says zero and 2019 it had 21.4. Does that, is that because that population is so small? <laughs> it was just, gotcha. Yeah, it kind yeah, of it's question. the same that those wild fluctuations from one year to the next because of your your small uh, okay. small numbers. All right. Okay. I don't see any other questions, Dr. Lopez. Thank you much, so much for your presentation. Thanks, y'all. Um, right. I'm not done. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, at this time, we have no registered speakers. So the public hearing on Texas, Mrs. Benjamin, just to confirm, okay. The public hearing on Texas Academic Performance Report is now closed. Okay, next thing on our agenda is our open forum for agenda items. So as stated on the posted agenda, members of the public who desire to address the board regarding an item on this agenda are required to register at www.aisd.net backslash board meeting speaker request. No later than 3 p.m. the day of the board meeting. Mrs. Benjamin, do we have any requesters registered to address the board regarding agenda items? Yes, ma'am. We have two speakers registered, one in person and one virtual. Okay. So this is a routine part of the school board's agenda for regularly scheduled meetings. This segment of the meeting provides citizens with an opportunity to share their views with the trustees on items that are on the agenda tonight. It is not intended to be a discussion or a debate, and trustees will not reply to the speakers. 
derogatory comments aimed at an individual will not be tolerated. Personnel matters are not appropriate subjects for open forum, and you will have two minutes to speak. Mrs. Benjamin will notify you when your time is up, and please end your presentation at that time. So our first speaker we have is um, Cindy Akalaluka. Hi. I missed the hog house at, at Interlochen. I missed it where I didn't see it this year. Was it missing? Aww. Good evening, President Mays, Dr. Cavazos, board members, everyone here and at home. Happy New Year. Um, I'm off the cuff. I'm, it's no time to prepare anything, but I'm speaking from my heart. I've reversed my order of requests to put them in priority. The kids, I know that's your priority. That's our priority. That's where we need everything. What the kids need is someone dedicated to work with them every day. We need a student interventionist for kinder through two who can work with students every day. Our budget has four hours a week for our grade level to have a tutor. That divides up to half an hour for my class a week. That's not gonna help anybody make any gains. They need somebody who can work with them every day. We have people who have suggested a teaching assistant for each grade level that can work with the students who need it. But they need help, daily help. Small class sizes and daily help. Teachers, need everything taken off their plates. We don't need any more meetings. We don't need any more trainings. We don't need coaching. We don't need packets and, and videos to watch. We have so much stuff. We have no time to go through it. What we've got, all good sources that if we had time to look through would help us in our classrooms. We need all those things taken away so we can work with our students and plan a plan lessons that meet their needs, see what they do with those lessons, and actually be able to meet them at the next step or go over it again. But because of the trainings and the meetings and all the things, we aren't able to do that. Thank you, Ms. Kalaluka. Keep it simple, please. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker on our agenda is um, virtual. And that is Maria Astorga. Do we have Maria? Maria, can you hear me? Um, yes, I do. Um, I'm sorry, but I have to speak in Spanish because my English is not so good. Can I do it? You can. Um, do we have someone, though, that can translate? Sure. OK. Dr. Cavazos will translate for you. I will, and Dr. Wirtz okay. will help me if he needs to. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm not putting you in the spot. <laughs> but he can, though, because I've heard him do it. OK. And um, Ms. Okay. Benjamin, can you be um, gracious on the time? Since so, si, si puede hablar en español, si gusta, y, y yo le voy a, a dar un, uh, 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 voy a decir lo que usted dice, dice en inglés. ¿Está bien? Um, sí, okay. está bien. Oh. We will double her time. That's typically okay. the same. Y le va a dar más tiempo para que pueda decir lo que quiera decir, pero también brevemente. Está bien. Okay. Bueno, primero que nada, buenas tardes a todos y gracias por la oportunidad. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, bueno, por lo que estoy aquí es porque quiero pedirles, por favor, que consideren la posibilidad de aprendizaje virtual para los niños. For, she would like for uh, um, us to consider the opportunity to have virtual instruction for students. Yo tengo tres niños, los tres tienen una condición médica. Eh, la mayor de ellas es más delicada. She has three children and one of them has medical conditions. Ellos, mis hijos habían estado en virtuales. La niña mayor está teniendo eh, homebound. Por su salud. The oldest uh, child has homebound because of her uh, health situation. Tengo otros dos niños, uno en tercer grado y uno en prekinder. 
Esta semana pues, fue la primera semana que fueron a la escuela. This is the first week they've actually attended school. She has one in third grader and one pre-kinder. La niña de pre-kinder regresó con una carta que decía que había estado en contacto con una persona positiva de COVID. The pre-kinder student uh, came back with a note and a letter that says she's been exposed to somebody who had uh, COVID positive. Bueno, no quiero poner en riesgo a mis hijos. Eh, su educación es muy importante para mí, pero obviamente su vida es más importante. She don't want to put her children at risk. Uh, her, their education is very important, but ultimately their health is, uh, takes priority. Uh, si esta enfermedad llega a mi casa, mi hija mayor va a morir. If this uh, disease, this virus uh, gets to her house, her oldest child will pass. Por eso, por mí y por padres como yo, quiero pedirles, por favor, que consideren esta posibilidad, por lo menos para niños como mis hijos que tienen alguna condición médica. They would like uh, for us, the district, to consider uh, virtual options for her younger children, uh, especially if they have a condition, a family member with a, condition, a health condition as such. Ahora mismo, mis dos hijas, la, la mayor y la niña de prekinder, pues, están en cuarentena por orden médica. Yeah, so uh, right now, prekinder and third grade child, is, is un, they're under quarantine. Uh, by, by uh, medical professional. Bueno, no es la de ter tercer grado. Ella está en el grado 8, pero es la que está teniendo homebound. Es la niña que tiene la condición más delicada, tiene problemas de corazón, pulmones y sangre. Her oldest, eighth grader, has the health conditions, that's who has the health conditions at home, uh, lung, heart, and uh, blood health condition. Y como madre, Mis hijos son muy importantes para mí y su salud es muy importante. Obviamente mother, no quiero perder ninguno de mis hijos. As a mother, their health is very important. It's a priority for her, and she uh, does not want to lose any of her children. Y es por eso, por mis hijos y por los hijos de otras personas que tal vez tienen una condición de salud también importante, es por eso que quiero pedirles, por favor, que consideren la oportunidad de educación virtual para niños con condiciones médicas. And it's for her children and other children with compromised health situations that she is asking for uh, district consideration of virtual options. Okay. Yeah, termino? Sí, bueno, ese es el punto que yo quería tratar. Solamente eso, pedirles por favor que ayuden a salvar a niños que pueden morir por este COVID. She, want, she wants to thank um, the board for uh, their attention and listening for uh, this this virtual option possibility to save children like hers uh, across the district. Muchas gracias, se lo agradecemos. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, those are all the registered speakers that we have for this evening. So next on our agenda are our action items. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mace. And uh, tonight we bring action item A for consider of the order of election for the school board for your consideration. Mrs. Fowler. Thank you, President Mace. I move that the board call a general election to be held on Saturday, May 7th. 2022 for the purpose of electing members to the Board of Trustees of the Arlington Independent School District to fill place numbers four and five. Thank you, Mrs. Fowler. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, so we have a motion by Mrs. Fowler, a second by Mr. Wilbanks. Any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, please vote. All present vote in the affirmative. Thank you very much. So a general election is hereby ordered to be held Saturday, May 7th, 2022, for the purpose of electing members to the Board of Trustees of the Arlington Independent School District to fill place numbers four and five. The main early voting polling site for all voters residing in Arlington Independent School District, including the portion of the district that lies within the city of Arlington, the city of Dalworthington Gardens, the Tarrant County portion of Grand Prairie, and the town of Pantego will be the following location. 
Tarrant County Election Center, 2700 Premier Street, Fort Worth, Texas, 76111, phone number 817-3831-8683. Between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., Monday through Friday, beginning April 25th, 2022 through April 29th, 2022, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Saturday, April 30th, 2022, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Sunday, May 1st, 2022, and between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday, May 2nd and May 3rd, 2022. Applications for a ballot by mail for voters residing in the Arlington Independent School District shall be mailed to Early Voting Clerk, P.O. Box 961011, Fort Worth, Texas, 76161-0011. Fax number 817-850-2344. Or an email transmission of a completed, scanned application for a ballot by mail containing an original signature can be emailed to votebymail at tarrantcounty.com. Note, effective December 1st, 2017, if an application for ballot by mail is submitted by fax or email, the original application must also be mailed and received by the early voting clerk no later than the fourth business day after receipt of the faxed or emailed copy. Applications for a ballot by mail must be received no later than the close of business on Tuesday, April 26, 2022. The order of election may be amended at a later date to include early voting sites added or deleted due to joint elections with other political divisions. This order of election is issued this 13th day of January, 2022. Okay, our next action item is consider adoption of local innovative plan for district District of Innovation designation. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mason. This evening we bring back for your consideration, we have we started a process with your approval and we bring now for your consideration the adoption of the local uh, District of Innovation designation. And as a reminder, we have a District of Innovation uh, plan that had been approved, but it is expiring and we need to uh, now uh, approve it again. The board needs to consider and approve it again if we wish to continue it. Dr. Wirtz has led the process for that, so Dr. Wirtz. All right, good evening, President Mays, members of the board, Dr. Gavasos, happy new year. It's nice to see everybody. Um, I'm back, as Dr. Gavasos indicated, to share with you a little bit about the process we went through to draft our new revised local innovation plan, provide a little bit of background, and then share a little bit about what's the content of that plan. So as he indicated earlier, we currently do have a local innovation plan already in place. It is set to expire on February 16th, 2000, oh, well, February 16th of 2022, uh, which is exactly five years from its adoption date. Uh, what is a district of innovation? So just as a reference point for those who may be listening for the first time, this was passed into law um, during the 84th legislative session by House Bill 1842. And what that bill did is it created the Texas Education Code Chapter 12A, which provided traditional school districts opportunities to access flexibilities that were normally reserved for those that were charter schools. Um, it is a plan that must be adopted by the school board and it is um, renewable every five years. So why would we consider remaining what is called our designation of District of Innovation? Well, one, it allows for an enhancement of local control, and it also gives us the opportunity to provide and ensure that there are meaningful program options for students that may be limited should some of these measures not be put in place. So what are some of the exemptions that could be potentially considered? This is a list that you see in front of you of, of a few, it's not exhaustive, exhaustive of uh, several of the exemptions that a district could consider. Um, in Arlington ISD, we do not consider all of these or we, we technically don't, um, we have not recommended we bring them forward. Some of them involve like teacher contracts and things like that because as you know, there are some of those provisions available with charter schools. We choose to maintain some of those things at the system level. However, to be eligible to be uh, a district of innovation with a local innovation plan, there are a couple of requirements. One is you have to maintain an academic and financial rating of what's considered acceptable. And also you have to physically adopt the plan um, as it's outlined using the process that's in the statute. 
if a plan is adopted, um, it needs to identify specifically which portions of the text education code that you're seeking an exemption from and provide a, a, an assurance that there's a comprehensive, a comprehensive educational program um, with, with um, innovations that include a variety of those things that you see in front of you, and many of them um, you'll notice are addressed. Some other things to consider is that once a plan is put in place, it can be amended, it can be rescinded or renewed by a majority vote. Um, you're only permitted to have one local innovation plan um, intact at a time. If you choose to adopt um, innovations that require policy change, so you, that, because you're actually uh, asking for exempts from legal statutes, uh, it may require you to go back to board policy to adjust some of your adopted board policies if, you, if, if one of them happened to be in the plan that's being recommended or adopted. And then finally, if the district receives um, an unacceptable academic or financial rating for two consecutive years, you lose your eligibility and TA may terminate the plan if they choose. So this is kind of the, uh, a brief uh, slide that just shows the big picture about the way we tried to strategically think about how to leverage the opportunity that just a local innovation plan could give us. Um, the first thing that we considered was there's a strategic plan that the board was considering um, in the same semester where we were looking at the possibility of a new local innovation plan. And what we wanted to do is make sure that as those strategies were being considered, um, the, the, the subcommittee that was working on the local innovation plan, um, that they thought about that strategic plan and identified opportunities to accelerate that work. Um, not necessarily do something different, but use the plan or to accelerate it. We also then um, studied the, the code and all the exemptions that are, that are available or listed to identify are there opportunities um, if exemptions were applied to accelerate that work and then go ahead and start the process of developing the plan. If you were to go online in the past and look at our, our past plan, there were six, made, six, uh, six exemptions that were uh, embedded in that plan, many of them that you're going to see roll forward into the new plan, and I'll explain to you why that's the case. We had several members um, that participated in our committee. This is the list of participants. It ranged from um, community members to um, teachers to principals to district staff. Um, we tried to create a wide range of people within our stakeholder groups to um, provide um, their input to the process. So what was our process? The first thing we did is we tried to understand um, and orient ourselves to what District of Innovation designation was and what the process and requirements were needed to actually obtain that designation. Because we assembled uh, the committee that, um, that you asked us to uh, based on the recommendation, some people, that was their first experience actually diving into what a District of Innovation was. So uh, as the person kind of um, facilitating that process, it was important to make sure that everybody at least had an equal playing field and an understanding about what it was so that they could engage equally in the work. The next thing we did is we made meetings. So we tried to gain a, an understanding of the, of the last local innovation plan and the exemptions that were included. Why were they there? And what, how was it typically used over the last five years? And then the last thing uh, we did was what I mentioned on the onset, which is really try to think how we could do strategic alignment between the strategic plan that was getting ready to be recommended and also these priorities that the district tries to do on a day-to-day -day basis. The interesting thing about, um, about uh, the local innovation plan is it's not just about accelerating work, it's also about reflecting and saying, hey, we have an opportunity for exemptions. Is When we do our think about our day-to-day -day work, is there anything that could be just made easier if we just were exempt from certain statutes? And so we consider that as well. So the, when we think about the strategic plan, um, there were four major um, strategies or priorities that came forth in the strategic plan. I know they're labeled all one, 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 which is very interesting because it doesn't, neither one is prioritized more than the other, but they're all listed there. Um, and what we did is we looked at these, these uh, specific strategies to try to figure out um, what, were the, what was the actual priority that the strategic plan was articulating, and then specifically what was the result that was supposed to be generated from that priority. So we started at a high level and then we moved into the individual action plans as a committee. So for example, if the first strategy that was articulated in the strategic plan was prioritizing high quality personalized learning experience, under that strategy were specific results, several of them um, which you know have been adopted in the strategic plan. So what the committee did is they looked at those and then as they considered each of those specific results, we went through a process where we considered the statutes, which you'll see them on the slide on the left-hand side, 
Uh, that's just a, a screenshot of a variety of the ones that you could potentially get exempted from. And then we went through a, a, like a protocol where we analyzed those potential statutes that we could apply for an exemption from aligned to the specific result. So if you'll notice on the right hand side, the specific result was articulated. We tried to understand what the general themes of that were and then we looked at the statutes to see are there any potential statutes that could actually impact that specific result connected to that strategy. So as it, we tried to be very li um, linear in trying to match things up and think about it rather than just trying to think of any strategy or any, any exemption and just go for it. We really wanted to make sure it was designed to um, accelerate the work that you were getting ready to adopt. And then as I mentioned earlier, we did pause as a team and ask ourselves, um, and that was one of the, the committee's homework assignments, which is to go back and just reflect on your own day-to-day -day work because the stakeholder group was very um, diverse and say, if you could just get an exemption from anything, would it help at all? And just consider whether those things actually were part of, the, would be some things we could bring in the plan or not. So finally, we, we went through all this process and we brought it all together. And this is, these are the big ways we did. Um, as I mentioned, we thought, what's the big idea we're trying to accomplish? Which portion of the statute would we want to seek an exemption from? How would that exemption help us with the innovations we're trying to um, uh, in, in implement here in the system? And then any other things we would need to consider as you're implementing those things um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is just a quick slide that just kind of outlines some of the pictures um, of people that participated in our work. And then uh, we analyzed, as I mentioned, the, the plan and we worked through those four steps. So this is a, a screenshot of the plan that was posted on our website on, I believe, December 2nd. Um, that's part of the rules. Um, once the plan is initially drafted, then um, we went to the DIDC, presented it to the DIDC, asked for a vote. It was unanimously voted for. At that evening after that vote was took place, we sent a letter to the Commissioner of Education indicating our desire to present um, this plan to the board and we posted it for 30 days as required by statute on the website. It's actually been up there longer than 30 days in preparation for your uh, uh, um, view of that plan tonight. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk through each of the innovations or the, the exemptions that we're recommending we consider. You will see that some of them are um, redundant, meaning they're just being carried over from the past, uh, which was very much part of our discussion, um, which I'll talk about as we're, as we're kind of going. So the first one is teacher certification. And really this is not, um, for anybody listening, a desire to stop doing teacher certifications. We're not recommending that at all. In fact, if TEA actually has a certification on file that a teacher would be required to get, um, we actually still want to continue with that process. We find value in that. But there are some programs where teacher certs are not available through TEA. We have some CTE programs. We have some language programs where they don't offer certifications. So we want to apply this certification, uh, this, in, uh, this uh, rec exemption, as an opportunity to locally certify people. The other thing about this, too, is we have, we have an opportunity to increase our candidate pool. And I'll just use one quick example. If you are a teacher, if you are a, a person who wants to enter in the CTE field, and you started the process of certifying in your 20s, and you didn't pass the test in the 20s and your 20s, and you went off into the workforce and you worked and did whatever it is that you were doing, and now you've gained a skill set that now you want to come and actually teach like a career tech course here in the district. If you started the process of exa examination for a cert in the state of Texas and you failed one time, you cannot. Um, you cannot get you, you cannot be exempted from the certification process TA requires that you go through it even if we would normally be able to take you and locally certify you like we would other people because of your workforce experience by applying this exemption we would allow ourselves not to have to go through that process and give our, our, our candidate pool the opportunity to grow so that people who have expertise in career tech kind of programming who may have initiated the process of a certification in their youth who are um, to not have to necessarily go through that whole process all over again, we can actually do it now locally. The other one is um, att minimum attendance for class credit or final grade. So this is a very interesting one because there is a statute that basically says that you can pass when you get seat time. And um, we, this is actually a challenge because it prevents students to enroll, especially in our, in our early college high schools, for example, from um, enrolling in courses that are based on interest and need. And it, so if we receive an exemption here, it mitigates this, this seat time requirement, allows them to optimize their, 
their uh, course load. It also reduces the need for credit recovery and remediation and acceleration, and we can award credit based on content mastery. So I'll give you another example. If I'm a student that goes to school, I could have an A in the class. But if my attendance caused me to miss more than that 90% rule, I have to come and do seat time. Otherwise, I can't get awarded credit. Um, if you're in the university or college and you could demonstrate that you understood the content and the mastery of the content and you missed class, um, our concern is do you know the content? And so what we want to do is, is, is try to find opportunities to provide students with um, the chance to earn credit based upon what we know they know and not just for the fact of whether they sat in school or not. What's important to note about this is that we're not trying to mitigate this idea of absenteeism. We're not encouraging kids to miss class to earn credit. What we're simply saying is there are some courses that actually don't meet seat time requirements that kids take in post-secondary institutions. They have mini semesters and they can earn course credit really, really quickly. We want to provide those opportunities to students and they can get it if they actually can be um, receiving credit based on what they know and mastery rather than just coming to class and sitting. First day of instruction is one we've had in the past before. This allows us to have flexibility in our school calendar. Um, as you know, the statute requires the school districts to start school no earlier than the fourth Monday of the month of August. Uh, this allows us to start our, our actual first semester earlier and balance out the number of days that are in the two semesters because one is naturally much shorter than the other if you don't do that. Last day of instruction is, is actually for um, our early college high schools. This would allow us to adopt a schedule where students can get out of class before, uh, before May 15th if needed. So our students at our early college high schools um, are now currently living within the calendar of TCC. Um, their Christmas or winter break is totally different than the rest of the districts. And also they finish at the end of the year at different times too, which allow them to participate in those mini semesters that we were talking about. Our continued exemption around this statute makes that feasible for that group. That group. This is actually one carried forward too as well. It's um, a financial one, which basically allows the school district the opportunity to, um, to uh, consider going beyond a two-year term, a two-year term uh, contract that they have with the depository bank. So, if the district normally the statute says that your your contract cannot exceed a two-year time period with the depository bank, if for some reason you feel as a, if the district feels that it's actually receiving the services that it needs, um, it can request that bank to. Uh, submit a plan or a proposal for us to extend their contract and we can actually bring it for another two years based on this um, this uh, statute and then finally minutes minimum minutes of instruction um, we have pre-k 3 in our district and pre-k 3 is a half-day program and if you want to maintain a half-day program within the calendar times that we have um, and still honor that teachers receive their duty-free lunch and their planning period as prescribed for the rest of the district, um, you, have to, uh, you have to apply for this exemption, which allows us to have some flexibility around the total number of minutes for the school year because their days are actually a, a little bit shorter uh, because it is a half-day. And when you add all those other two components in there with the teacher's um, lunch and their planning period, you wouldn't meet the minimum requirement. So this allows us to still continue with our pre-K-3 program but allow teachers to have their same duty-free and plan teacher planning periods that the rest of the district gets. So this is just a slide articulating what our process was, has been in the proposed timeline. As you can see here, we are now at January 13th um, where we are presenting this to you. Um, if the board chooses to approve this plan, it will go into effect immediately and it has to be done by a two-thirds majority vote. And so we are recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the plan as it's been presented. Thank you very much, Dr. Wirtz. Um, do I have any trustees with any questions? Yes, Mrs. McMurray. Oh, sorry. Do it again. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wirtz. Quick question. Can we go back to the slide about the teacher certification? Yes. Um, so we talked about the need for providing professionals to teach our specialty courses, which we offer a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to clarify something for the teachers that teach our core academic subjects, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the specialty areas, would they would eventually need to reach 
highly qualified through SBEC status, right, to remain employed with us? Yes. In fact, this, that's, I'm, and I'm glad you're asking this question so we can reiterate it for anybody that's listening. This is not intended, and we have no intention as a district to abandon certification requirements that SBEC has for teachers and specifically what you're asking around four subject areas. This is simply how do we how do we create an increased candidate pool so that specialty courses where certs are not even offered at the at uh, at the state level can be offered here. And I'll give you uh, an example, uh, one that we do already. At Wimbish Elementary, we have a French dual language program, and there is not a French dual language certificate at the state level. So what we do is we do a dual kind of scenario where they have a low French certificate and we require our teachers to obtain that portion of the normal certification process, but the dual portion we certify on our side. So it's a way of marrying some things. If there is a component of the certification requirement for a, for a position that we feel like we can leverage at the state level in combination with our own work, we'll do that if it's completely void. Like remember we used to do, um, uh, we, we do do this, instrument repair that's locally certified. We There is no such thing at the state level. We create it here at our level, and this allows us to do it. But, that makes a lot of yes. sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMurray. Mr. Wilbanks? Thank you, President Mays. And if there are no other comments, I had prepared to make a motion to approve the plan. And I before that, I would like to say, um, I agree with this wholeheartedly. This gives us the flexibility we need. Uh, given our first um, strategy and our strategic plan to meet every student where they are, provide highly uh, tailored um, instructional plans for every student. Um, so with that, I move the board to approve the local innovation plan as presented tonight. Do I have a second? Second. So I've got a motion by Mr. Wilbanks, a second by Mrs. McMurray. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Wirtz. Next on our agenda is our discussion action items. Our first item is consider the board handbook. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mason. Uh, annually, we bring the board handbook for any revisions. Uh, this actually goes through the governance committee um, and that has been sent out and they've been working on that uh, and this is an opportunity to either provide any feedback or uh, or just uh, consideration. So I'll ask Mr. Chapa, who's the chair of the governance committee, if he wants to make any comments. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Mays. Uh, no real update uh, beyond uh, what Dr. Cavasso says. Uh, said we have reviewed this in governance committee. We are looking at some some edits. Um, Ms. McMurrow has submitted some, and we're just we have been over several years continuing to, to tweak this handbook. Uh, it certainly looks a lot better. It is more streamlined than it was a few years ago. Our process with presenting the handbook has traditionally been to uh, bring it up for discussion at one meeting after dissemination to the board and then to uh, to go back um, finalize and, and then bring it uh, forward at the next meeting uh, for a final vote and so this is the first of those meetings so uh, be happy to hear any feedback on the handbook and if there's none tonight um, happy to, to take hand edits or uh, word version edits or, or any <laughs> sticky notes uh, whatever you would like to send with your thoughts regarding the board handbook, the governance committee would be happy uh, to, to review those and we'll be bringing this back uh, again at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Mr. Hogg? Thank you, President Mays, and thank you, Mr. Chapa and governance committee. I did mine in crayon, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Mr. Chapa. Um, so with that, um, I do have some tweaks and changes. Most of them, Mr. Chapa, are just small little words here and there, a um, couple of things. You know, like, um, if, if yeah, I don't need to go through all of them, but just to give you an idea of a couple of them. But, you know, some of our comments to public, we're usually doing three minutes, five minutes. We need to allow our president to do that. We talk about open form cards. We've gone electronic. We need to make sure we update that on some of those. Some of the items on consent agenda, um, as we've had changes, we I think we're limiting a little bit 
on what we can say, we can put on there, and, and we as a board are kind of tweaking that. Um, communications, if I get information from the superintendent by fax, I'm in trouble. Uh, and if I'm expected to send it by fax, we're all in trouble, because I don't think I know how to, I could go one place to go to the center, the mail center, and maybe have a fax on there. So just tweak some of those. And then the last thing I add, Mr. Chopper, that we may want to think about, and maybe it's just a link to something on our, our website, but you know, as, as the focus has become on uh, student achievement and HB3 and how we're reviewing those, I think it's probably a good idea in the board handbook to maybe have a link to our website, um, or potentially the calendar showing what we're planning to review. And maybe it's just a link, maybe it's that, uh, that calendar that's listed in there, but I think showing something like that's probably beneficial to folks. But I will uh, pass over some of my edits and uh, overall I think we have a strong board handbook. Um, updating it as soon as possible and keeping it going and making sure we stay up to date on the calendar is always a critical factor. But thank you guys for the work. Thank you, Mr. Hogg. Mr. Wilbanks. I just want to reiterate, I, I concur with my colleague Mr. Hogg on a lot of those changes. Um, number one, the facts after watching uh, um, Ted Lasso recently with my wife and the struggles <laughs> Ted Lasso had sending his divorce papers by fax. Um, yeah, we need to remove that. Uh, a big ta Ted Lasso fan, if you, if you can't tell. The other thing that I think is very important is I think it's adamant. I would, I would be a little more stronger than you, Mr. Og, that our uh, HB3 bo um, goal monitoring calendar is such important um, and is a huge part of our work and focus that it needs to be included um, in the board handbook. Um, kind of the general highlights of what we hit each uh, board meeting in terms of monitoring those goals. Um, so with that said, uh, great job. You've done a miracle in making, um, I, I can't believe you let, my pictures didn't get edited out uh, to make it look more attractive, but um, somehow you left them in, a, in there, but this I, is just I guess a I won't complain. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe improve it by removing those pictures out and and putting more of Miss Mays in in my place. That would probably make it look a little better. Uh, so with that, um, I would like. Uh, well, um, it looks good. I don't know if we're moving to adopt it or this. No, is, I think the chair right, said yeah. All right. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilbanks. Um, I just want to thank uh, again our board chair, uh, Mr. Chapa and Melody and. <clears throat> Melody Fowler and Sarah McMurrah for working on the handbook and very excited to see any additional revisions and have an opportunity to, to vote on all the hard work you've done. Thank you. Okay, next discussion action item, COVID-19 school operations update. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mays. And uh, tonight, as we have uh, for a number of meetings, we bring a COVID-19 school operations update and there are some uh, new things to report as this um, uh, pandemic continues to, to change and at different uh, challenges. So uh, Dr. Hill will lead us through the uh, COVID-19 school operations update. Dr. Hill. Thank you, Dr. Fasos, President Mays, board members, and uh, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to give another update on the COVID-19. We've got a brief uh, presentation here, and then we'll entertain some uh, discussions. But just an overview first, and we'll be discussing just vaccine testing and other mitigation efforts. We'll look at some revised TEA slash CDC uh, uh, guidelines for isolation periods. We'll look at some countywide conditions, look at the AISD uh, dashboard and some of our weekly trends, and then some COVID uh, campus supports that we're providing to the campuses uh, by way of uh, human resources and some uh, reduced uh, workload, if you will. Uh, just so vaccine, vaccine efforts, again, the Arlington Fire Department still has their uh, vaccine site up at, at 2920 South Cooper, and we want to continue to push people to that uh, uh, location if they're interested in the vaccine and or the boosters. Uh, testing mitigation, uh, we have relocated our uh, ASD testing clinic to 1203 West Pioneer Parkway, and we're there Monday through Friday, 6 to uh, 2 p.m., and Tuesday, Thursday from noon to 7. Uh, we'll report that we will likely be uh, closing that uh, temporarily until we can get more testing in. We actually ran out of tests today, and uh, we, that clinic closed about 7:10 tonight, and we were able to get all those that were in line to test today, but we're actually out of test, and we've got another order on place already. 
uh, we were partnering with Tarrant County and a third party vendor to uh, stand up a site at our uh, athletic arena. We're scheduled to start that on Monday. Uh, we'll go Monday through Saturday from 6 until 3, 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., or maybe it's 7 to 3, I believe. But on this coming Monday, we'll start at noon. Uh, but beyond that, we'll start uh, at 7. And then because of some events that we may have scheduled at the arena, we'll have some blackout dates, and we'll communicate those through the third-party vendor in the county uh, well in advance. Just some test data from our testing center. Uh, and this is through the end of the day on yesterday. We've tested over 2,400 uh, uh, or administered over 2,400 tests, and 70, 794 have come back positive, which is a positivity rate of right at 32.7 percent. It's kind of in line, uh, very high with, with what's going on in the county. Uh, the county may be a little bit higher than ours. So other mitigation factors, we're continuing to strongly encourage a mask and uh, continue to require symptomatic individuals to stay at home. Uh, don't come to school, don't come to work, and to get tested as soon as possible. Just the revised CDC uh, slash TEA guidelines uh, for public health, and it's basically the staff who have tested positive for COVID-19, there's an option for them to uh, reduce their isolation period to, from 10 days to five days since the symptom onset if they are fever, uh, if their symptoms are improving and they've been fever free without fever reducing medication for at least 24 hours. Again, this is in line with what the CDC has recommended and, and we've got guidance from TEA as well. Uh, some Tarrant County statistics. Uh, this is again straight from the county website. The community spread is back at high now and you can see the seven day average as of January 8th was at 39%. The virus spread as of January 8th is increasing as well and you can see uh, all of those uh, indicators are increasing uh, from that dashboard. And this is, again, consistent within the district as well as with the county. Uh, just through Wednesday, January 12th, in the district, we've had over 5,900 positive cases. 11, 1,186 have been staff members, over 4,600 students, and 11 visitors. And again, this is on the district's dashboard, dashboard and it's updated. Uh, we say by 5 p.m. daily, we really try to get there, but the nurses at the campus who are responsible for this, they, they're slammed right now. And so sometimes it's a little bit later than that, but we get it updated daily. And this is here our, our weekly trends. You can see where we started back. Uh, we're actually, because this spreadsheet is getting so long, we're actually taking off a week every time we add another week just to kind of make the data not so cumbersome. But you can see the spike. And again, this is within the district and it's consistent with what's going on in the county as well. So you can see it's reported only for, for four days this week because tomorrow's not on there yet and it was the same make for last week. And the COVID support that we've been providing, uh, the substitute office in human resources are working diligently to try to uh, provide as many substitute uh, teachers as possible. It's been a challenge, but they're working uh, to try to uh, enhance that. Uh, we are, the principals are uh, reassigning non-teaching staff at the campus and, for example, instructional coaches and interventionists, interventionists and et cetera, assigning uh, those positions to fill classroom roles when teachers are out uh, for various reasons. And then we've also created, uh, through the help or the guidance of Office of School Leadership, the uh, central office helping hands, and that's basically redeploying uh, staff from central office out into the buildings to provide uh, classroom coverage for, for teachers that are out. And so uh, it's a challenge. We're all just all hands on deck, basically. We've also in included or implemented a what we call a January pause, and that's just some of the things that we've had planned and scheduled uh, that would impact the teacher in some sort of way. We're kind of pausing that on, on, in, during the month of January, and then we will kind of reassess uh, how the cases are going and then uh, maybe extend it or potentially just make a decision at that point. Uh, pausing in instructional learning days, uh, the engage to learning sessions, uh, uh, moving those coaching sessions into actual classroom visits, uh, pausing all external and in-house in uh, active learning cycle coaching, and you can see the list, I don't want to read that and bore you, but that's kind of what the January pause uh, includes. So our next steps, we'll continue to monitor uh, the staff and the ability to effectively cover classrooms by school. And if necessary, we would consider closing a grade level or potentially uh, the impacted school uh, as, as the conditions uh, warrant. So 
constant eye on it and constant communication with principals and others about what we can do to, to assist. And so that's the update at this point. We'll be glad to have any discussions or questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Do I have any trustees with questions? Mr. Chapa? Thank you, President Mays. Dr. Hill and, and also Dr. Cavazos, um, are, are there any plans uh, to provide some sort of virtual option for individuals like we heard from earlier tonight who have a, a medical reason or some other severe concern with their children attending school? So um, without getting into any specific case, with I'm speaking now in generalities, um, we do have homebound services and students can apply and become eligible uh, to, uh, to receive homebound services. Just for clarity, if there's a quarantine situation, a parent wants to quarantine their child because they've been exposed or otherwise, uh, we do provide them makeup work. And that is a very effective way to make sure that they don't fall behind. There's a lot of communication, so it, I know it sounds at the extreme that when you come back, you'll get your makeup work, but what is actually happening in many practices is they send them the work, and it's more of a, of a during the time they're out. Uh, but that those options are, are available and they're used. Uh, those are the tools we have right now uh, to, to provide instruction when somebody's out for quarantine. But if there's somebody with a health reason, a student with a health reason, by all means, we want them to apply for homebound services because that's a very effective way. And outside of a pandemic, homebound services is very effective as well. So it's, it's a service that we must provide, and, 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 but we do uh, make a lot of use of it. So we are, we are not um, at this time contemplating uh, reinstituting a virtual option like we did in the first semester for an additional few weeks or six weeks or anything like that's that? That's correct. We are not at this time. And, and I'll give you a little rationale behind that it, uh, without getting too mired in detail, but uh, the, probably the biggest rationale would be our staffing challenges. To reorganize staff, it was already a challenge to provide virtual when, um, when the spike wasn't there. With the spike and the gaps and the challenges with staff and, and all that, we probably would struggle to do both very well, both virtual and in, in class. There's just the staff um, availability is very limited because it took a large number of staff to stand up virtual to begin with before the spike. Uh, and then the other is, is we want to make sure that we're mindful that, again, things can change, but there is a plateau that seems to be happening and um, predictions even by the county is that by the end of January things will get better. Um, so we don't want to keep disrupting that um, virtual and things that we probably can't do very effective right now anyway because of staff. Okay. And speaking of the, the you know, if Dr. Hill, you said all hands are on deck and, and you're mentioning the, the coverage gaps. And, we, you know, we've heard from quite a few folks that, that that's pretty severe need on some of their campuses. What is the rubric? Do we, I know we probably don't have a formal rubric, but what's the threshold at which we make a decision to, you know, shut down a grade, shut down a, a, a building? I know in our district, our size and in different parts of the district are, you know, affected maybe differently than, um, than others, it's it's unlikely to do a district closure. Is my is my guess right. what you're thinking is? But what's the threshold short of that? So um, it, it's an art and a science, and I'm going to let the artist and scientist, maybe uh, the person who actually uh, gathers this information um, and and actually recommends to me when it's time. I'll, I'll tell you, it's 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 it may sound clear cut, but it's not. I'll just preempt a little bit. There's a lot of overlap. So when People are out because they've tested positive. They're going to come back at a certain point, and then others are out. So it's during those overlap periods where we have a large number out, but in a couple of days, the ones that were out, you know, 10 days ago will be coming back and things like that. So Dr. Brown, give us some insight into the, uh, the, the work that I know the assistant superintendents and EDs do with principals to get to ultimately a very quick recommendation to me. And, Absolutely. I'm um, art and science. It's quite a combination when it comes to COVID. Um, what I'll say is first, I want to just, you know, thank the, the staff at the schools, 76 schools, and, the, and, and we've not had to make any kind of closures until, of course, a small one today. 
Um, but the reality is what they're focusing on um, as a campus is assessing every single day the number of staff members who they have out and where they might be able to pull to get coverage um, on campus. We also have our helping hands that sometimes we're having to pull from other campuses to a severe campus. And so the principals are working in concert with the EDs and identifying how long people will be out because of COVID, when they're coming back, who I might be able to push into different classrooms, where I might be able to combine classes. And so they've done masterfully in the last week and a half of really being able to try to make sure we have coverage in every single classroom. And so um, it's the principals working in concert with the ED and then we get together, we make the, we, we assess kind of the, the landscape and determine if it's in the best interest of students um, because of safety and otherwise for us to make a decision to close a grade level, which is our, our first, you know, run at it is trying to do a grade level versus a school. And so I know, you know, this is, our experience with the virus has ebbed and flowed over the last two years and, you know, we very much hope yes. we wouldn't be talking about this this time of year, but we're in this situation and there's a really severe spike right now. The, the data on whether or not this is as severe as prior variants, I think, is is coming out the direction of it's less severe, but it's the spread is is much larger. When we have those, so the more people get it, and we staff are going to be out at least five days under the new guidance. Students are still out ten days. I think a concern I have is during those periods where we're having a couple days of or weeks of overlap, where we're really having to pull people around. You know. You, we're talking about coverage. It doesn't mean that the students are getting instruction. And so what is your sense of, of how, what's the magnitude of that problem? I mean, are we experiencing, are we functionally open, but effectively not providing instruction in many instances? And if so, what's, what is your sense of how much of a problem that is? Yeah, I would say we're not there yet, um, Trustee Chapa. We still have certified teachers going into classrooms. There are some cases where we have a paraprofessional helping support, but in general, if you're pulling a testing facilitator, even our specialists from central office are all certified teachers. So the expectation is, is that we're still trying to deliver high quality instruction as best we can with the fluid fluidity of what's happening in and out of the classroom. So right now, if you're asking, is it kind of like a babysitting or we just have a warm body there, we are not there. The expectation is, is we still have the best instruction as possible for our students. Okay. And are we providing any sort of additional compensation to the folks who are having to do extra coverage or combined classes or anything like that? Yes, we are. We've updated that. Um, we've updated that and provide a little bit more um, starting in the fall. And so our paraprofessionals now receive extra, um, I think it's up to $25 now an hour for covering a classroom, even teachers. Um, who have to take in extra students or teachers who use their planning period to cover a classroom, if that's a choice they make, they do get compensated for that as well. And so okay. we wanted to make sure providing that is a little, it's not, you know, it's a little nudge to say, we appreciate it, we know it's an inc inconvenience, but we certainly want to compensate you as best we can. Okay, what about li like librarians? So those, and I've heard of some of the, some librarians being used for that purpose, do they qualify for that as well? So, so we, so on, we are, making sure to assess, um, and we had a conversation with HR even today, to make sure that we assess and how much can we expand the payment for taking classes. Because we have librarians, GT teachers, dyslexia teachers, others that are, again, also being pulled um, to, to do what Dr. Brown has described, which is not just fill in, but to provide some instruction, right? So that's our ideal. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that this has a relationship with student attendance. Mm -hmm. So why we're not at that point to a large scale in many places is because student attendance is down too. So you have fewer students, fewer staff, but you, you still have to make a match there. So it's not like in some of these schools that we have high student attendance and low teacher availability because I think they're proportional. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why that we can still manage and provide the expectation of instruction. Uh, but, but yes, so librarians, GT teachers, dyslexia teachers, individuals like that, uh, we're assessing to make sure that they're eligible as well for, um, for payment if they haven't been receiving, which we think they have, but we're making sure. Okay. And Trustee Chompa, I may have not said the right number, so I'll make sure that we get the right information to you as it relates to the compensation for okay. the extra no, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Um, another, so I, we know there's new TEA CDC guidance with respect to staff. 
is it still, I'm assuming it's still 10 days for students and that that's gonna change in the near, possibly change in the near future, right? It, well, so uh, last Friday, um, this past Friday, the T Texas Education Agency changed the staff um, uh, availability or, or ability to come back, you know, under certain conditions that Dr. Hill covered. But they have not adjusted the student. And last Friday, they indicated, the agency TEA indicated that they would be working on this and try to do the same for students, just to be simple. And we had a call today, and that has not been done. And it was less um, optimistic from TEA that they were going to do that for students. OK. Doesn't mean it's ruled out, because they changed their mind. As if you've noticed, the TEA changes their mind. But it was less optimistic for immediate change to that and I think our next call is scheduled for two weeks okay so a question that, that I think comes from that is is if we have students who are out for 10 days you know that's it as you get your student gets older you know that could, that adds up to a substantial amount of makeup work um, and they're but they're also not in the classroom so in that I think it makes that even that much harder to catch up on the makeup work I would ex expect for you know especially junior high and high school students who might be in more advanced classes or, or whatnot, they, you know, that the potential for falling behind, I think, is a, is a real one there, and, and students are probably, and parents are probably worried about that. Is there any way, or is, has it been considered at all, that on a case-by-case -case basis, maybe with an individual teacher, if there's a student who's home, um, because some of the students, just like the adults, they might be better in, in four or five days and, and be feeling well enough to be up to doing it, is there a way for them to maybe work out a situation individually with the teacher to say, hey, can, you know, can you pop up a Chromebook and, and set up a Zoom and I can just at least listen in and they don't fall as far behind? Is that something that we could consider doing? Yeah, we can certainly, uh, we can certainly have yeah. a conversation about that. It probably would be more case by case, as you mentioned, Trustee Chapa, depending on if the staff member is in the classroom and just making sure they have all the resources they need available, especially if the kid is at home. Um, what we've said now is we've, we um, allow the same number of days that you were absent. You have that many days to make up work. However, if there are extenuating circumstances, extended illness or things like that, we can certainly work with the students on an individual basis. Okay. And, and I want to make, make sure that for clarity as well that these, so outside of pandemic, let's just set that aside for a minute. <clears throat> these interactions happen. Teachers interact with students when they're out, when they're going to be out for a period of time. There's a lot of interaction with, with uh, teachers and students. During pandemic, there's also that interaction. So it's not like we're not going to talk to you until 10 days when you come back. It, there's a lot of interaction. Uh, it is challenging, absolutely, to be trying to do your own makeup work. But there is interaction. There is calls and things that teachers have always done with students who are out. Uh, and now it's no different. I will say that sometimes the teachers are out as well because of this. Mm -hmm. And so there is nobody that can connect right away with the students. But that's a common uh, interaction that happens with teachers and students when they're out. Right. And I, I think my question stems mainly from the fact that when we, you know, in non-pandemic times when we don't have these strictures in place, it, it's the rare case where a student is going to be out for 10 days. But with this, it, it's, it's pretty much mandatory they're going to be out for 10 days. and so. It's the, the aspect of, of not just getting the makeup work or having the communication, but not being present for instruction that I think I get a little worried about because you're looking at kids, may, you know, depending on how the 10 days falls, you know, missing, um, was it seven or eight school days? And that's, the, and many of them doing it. And so that's, that's a concern I have. Um, I don't really have any other questions. Um, I would be remiss, I think, if I didn't say something I don't want to beat a dead horse, but, uh, and I don't even know if it's an appropriate metaphor anymore, but, um, you know, I can't help but think that if we had the ability um, to not just encourage masking, um, that, that some of what we're experiencing now could have been mitigated and would be mitigated, um, but we can't. Um, we'll note that the Austin Court of Appeals last week um, ruled against the governor's executive order becoming the third Court of Appeals, I believe, in Texas to do so. Um, and also a federal district court in Austin issued an injunction against the executive order for discriminating against students with disabilities. Um, however, that, 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 and that was a permanent injunction after, after essentially a trial on the merits. Um, I will note that that ruling has been stayed by the Fifth Circuit temporarily during the appeal. And so I think legal, as a legal matter, uh, our hands remained tied on that. And we have hashed this battle out many times here, and I don't want to, uh, to refight it here again tonight, but I do want to, once again, uh, put on record 
my extreme displeasure uh, with the executive overreach that we have had to endure during this, this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Mrs. McMurrah? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Cavazos and um, Central Administration for implementing the Central Office Helping Hands um, and the January pause. That's huge. Um, I would even, you know, call it more of a January repurposing than a January pause because, um, you know, the ship isn't stopping. All of, all of the bullets there in the January pause slide, that doesn't mean instructional support for teachers isn't there. Correct. Um, that doesn't mean collaboration is stopping. That doesn't mean lesson planning um, is stopping. But it does mean that we value our teachers and administrators and support staff's physical and, in, in many cases, mental health. And um, this is an action that I really hope that we could consider um, extending even beyond January. Um, like I said, you know, teachers get instructional support at a campus level, um, whether they have their E2L coaching sessions or not. Um, and, you know, if you work on a campus or if you are supporting someone that does um, at this time, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I love these two initiatives. I really hope that, uh, and I know it's already probably in the works, but I really hope that it could be considered to um, extend. And I've heard a lot of great feedback from campus staff as well. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McMurrah. Thank you, Mrs. McMurrah. Mrs. Fowler. Thank you, President Mays. I was having a conversation today with the retired Arlington teacher, Renthea Clements, who was an English teacher at Martin. And she's come up with a really great plan that I think may be helpful for a lot of students since they have to be out for the 10 days. Um, she has a nonprofit Excel Learning Academy and they're all staffed with retired Arlington teachers. She is, um, she has been doing all the tutoring and her group in person, but she's offering to do virtual tutoring to students who have to be out for the 10 days. And they'll do 30 minute lessons, they'll do hour lessons, they have specialists in reading, writing, all levels of math, foreign languages, chemistry, they do it all. And these are retired teachers who know the material, know the students, know the schools. And I think it's a really great opportunity for a lot of these students who are gonna be out for 10 days. They could do a Zoom call with a qualified teacher. Uh, these teachers also have access if the student and parent says it's okay, these teachers can reach out to the student's teachers and find out, you know, what are you doing? What do we need to prepare for? So they can have that communication. And I think this may really be something for these students that are being out for 10 days, instead of feeling so lost and not knowing what's going on, these teachers are there and they'll do the, the virtual call with them. They'll do the Zoom, they'll teach them, they'll get them caught up, they'll keep them uh, caught up with the rest of the class. So it's Excel Learning Academy and they're a nonprofit. They're located in um, Lake Church. They're on Little Road and very convenient, but they're offering all these virtual tutoring sessions to the students who have to be out for 10 days. And it's grade one through 12, they, they tutor it all. So I think this may be an opportunity for these students to not feel like they're getting behind and feeling lost that they have a teacher that could be teaching them. And I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you for that information. We certainly can look into that. Trustee Fowler. Thank you, Mrs. Fowler. Mr. Wilbanks. Thank you, President Mays. And thank you, um, Trustee Fowler. Um, I think that's an excellent resource because my main concern is what we've seen is a huge disruption with Omicron in terms of continuity of instruction with in, in being able to uh, get kids back to a regular pace in their learning. Um, and we know, we, you know, I've said over and over again tonight, we've got a heavy lift here. And I think providing a resource like that is in, incredible. And, I, and uh, we also know that teachers are stressed out and burned out, and this has been very hard, and Omicron has made it even harder. And so I concur with my colleague, Ms. McMurrow, as well, that 
thank you for the helping hands. And I would reiterate her push if we could extend the January pause into uh, February, uh, at least, and then reevaluate um, because they are overworked and stressed out, and this is, you know, it's been difficult. So, it's been very well received from teachers I've talked to, and so we could, whatever we can do to extend that, if that's a possibility, I would, I would um, jump on Miss McMurrow's bandwagon on on that idea. Um, the other thing, again, my concern is where students are in the disruption that this current wave has um, put with the number of students out on quarantine and I'm a little bit confused because I know you know we changed the five uh, down to five days we know with this variant that the Delta but or the the well <laughs> the uh, number of days between exposure and when onset of symptoms are is greatly reduced from Delta and previous and then um, you know, since most people are vaxxed, their actual days of experiencing the illness are just a couple of days, unlike with previous. And so five days makes sense, um, especially for staff, and I'm glad to see it's moving in that direction. And I'm a little disheartened to find out that the rules and the hands of the commissioner are tied, that we can't do the same thing for students. Um, and I know it's frustrating because you read all the time, I, I, I read what's going on nationally at other schools and the best practices uh, in the response to this ongoing uh, pandemic that a popular strategy is test to stay um, or test to return where uh, they have policies for students um, uh, to, if they're exposed, to not quarantine um, or if they're, they currently had the disease and then test negative uh, to return, I mean, is there anything we can do around that? I, you know, I know we're we're kind of stuck on if you've got it, you've got it's ten days period for students. There's no other options we have that if they're recovered to bring them in sooner. Just want clarification on that. Yeah. So um, set a context to this. So interestingly enough, commissioner and others pushed really hard because it's not easy. You're, uh, with the bureaucracy to make it a communicable disease um, classification last year. But that came with restrictions. Mm -hmm. And it applied last year. That's what, but it became on the list of communicable disease. So those restrictions uh, haven't been lifted, and there's really no way around it as we understand it and as he's described. He's working on it because just like they've classified it communicable disease with those parameters, very specific, by the way, parameters. Uh, he's trying to get it, you know, adjusted, and that's that's his continued work. He was actually he, being commissioner, was uh, hopeful to be able to, you know, have a change to this week, and uh, he didn't go into detail as to what what roadblock he hit, but um, it just didn't seem very optimistic about it. In fact, like I said, our next call is scheduled for two weeks from now, so it's not like something is imminent. It could all change. Uh, I think he's also, the Department of Health is also seeing that this may be a plateau and things may be starting to change again and by the time they change it, maybe things have changed, but that's speculation on that. But the other part is, is the reality is it's classified that way and he doesn't seem to have any uh, ability to change it right now. Okay, and so just to be clear, because I get asked this by parents, is that if their student tests positive, it's 10 days, no matter what, even if they test negative after recovering. I was looking at uh, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Minerly and she's saying yes, that's true. It's 10 days, period. Yes, it is. And again, the, the communicable disease and that whole process that took a long time, by the way, was finally done and now it seems to be uh, something that we're locked into, or he's locked into. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wellbanks. Um, I do not see any other questions. I have one question, uh, Dr. Hill, and that's just for clarity. Um, on the slide that you had, thank you, Dr. Brown. On the slide that you had up that had the locations and saying how we ran out of the uh, testing kits, 
at our location on Pioneer. Yes. But we're opening up another one on Monday with Tarrant County. It's a partnership with Tarrant County. Okay, so if we don't get in the supplies, just so the community knows, because I know that's been a very successful testing site, yes. they can go there on Monday if we're not open again on Pioneer. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And that's on our website. It's a pop-up on the website as we speak. Very directly. good. And other locations in Arlington that are currently available as correct. well. So Very it's good. in addition to, to those. Thank Very you, Dr. Hill. Yes. It's a good thank you for the point because thank you for your work on securing that again. We, we let it go because there was no, no demand and now we need it back. And Dr. Hill, thank you for your persistence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, I would like to uh, switch <coughs> things up. So before we go to the consent agenda, I would like to go ahead and move to um, um, letter B under discussion, our 2021-2022 financial update. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mason. So we have a, a financial update that Ms. Moss has done before, and so we bring this financial update. It's appropriate to bring these on a frequent basis, uh, and we want to do it before consent because it has information there that uh, applies to the consent information as well. So Ms. Moss, take us through the financial update. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mays, trustees, and um, uh, we thank you for your service. Appreciate you all. Um, again, as Dr. Cavasso said, we want to, on a regular basis, bring you up to speed on finances. Tonight's financial update will be brief, uh, and it will focus on the budget part of, the, uh, of our finances tonight, so we'll go through that. There we go, a little pause. Um, so tonight, uh, the finances that we're talking about are as of November the 30th uh, of 2021. Uh, the last time we presented our finances to you, we talked about the general fund only, and we had told you that we would talk about some of the other funds uh, in our other uh, presentations. So tonight, we'll talk about our food and nutrition, our natural gas, debt service, and our capital projects funds. So these are some of the items that are financial items that are in the consent agenda item tonight. And we'll start with that general operating budget. So in the budget amendment for general operating, I may be, my button's going, I'm pushing the button, but it's not going, so. There we go. So the major changes in general operating are the $2.4 million increase in other revenues, and that's an additional insurance recovery. We've talked about that before from the winter storm. Also, the $5.8 million that you see in, is um, in multiple expenditure functions. Uh, that's the one-time payment for employees that was uh, paid out in December of 2021. And then we have $890,000 in multiple expenditure functions, again, that are adjustment to workers' compensations budget. So here's just a look uh, at the revenue on uh, the budget amendment and the general operating fund. That 571 is what was adopted back in June, and we did have one revision already, so that changed it to 585. If you'll recall, that was a $13 million in ESSER from 2020 uh, that uh, was in moved to the 2022 budget from the 2020 2021 budget that moved to the 2022 budget so in tonight's budget amendment we are proposing a 2.4 million dollar uh, change men this button are not working tonight so the 2.4 let me see if i can go there you go it's a very 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 long pause so the 2.4 million dollars is again insurance um, adjustments as we said on the previous screen and once that's approved that number that was adopted for, at uh, in june 30th of 571 will change to 587.7 million on the expenditure side of the budget uh, the, a large amount there is the $2.7 million. That's an offset for some of the insurance on the winter, um, winter storm again. And again, the total expenditures as adopted was $584 million. 
the revised budget and the first budget amendment was 588. We're asking tonight on the expenditure side for 9.5 million, which would land us at 598.3 million once it is approved. The surplus we adopted in June was 12.8 million. The initial uh, budget amendment changed that to 3.5 million tonight the revenue and the expenditures total 7.0 million that we're asking you for making the uh the surp uh, the deficit budget 10.6 million tonight after approval so some um just want to share again and, and remind you of some of the future, fin future financial considerations we're looking at of course, we're still dealing with the impact of COVID-19 um, that you've heard that uh, several times tonight. It's impacting our enrollment. It's impacting our attendance. Uh, but we do have the ESSER funds that will help on the budget side. And of course, the whole harmless. We've, um, uh, TEA has told us that we will be held harmless for the first uh, six weeks. They're looking at the fourth six weeks as well. What we're hoping is they look at this year in a whole as, has, as they've done in the past. Uh, that would be very beneficial for the district if they did. Again, we're still looking at local and state uh, economic conditions. Uh, fortunately, here in Arlington, we're still doing well as far as the economy. Um, we're looking at the state's ability to sustain the current level, level of state funding and Senate Bill 1. We talked about that the last time in the last financial update where that uh, $25,000 homestead exemption is changing to $40,000 if approved by the voters. And so the impact of ESSER funding, I just want to put this up there as a reminder for you, the $13.9 million that I spoke of earlier, we talked about that in the last update, and the $5.6 million reduction of budgeted general fund uh, expenditures that were applied to the ESSER budget and uh, taken out of the general operating budget. So now we'll move on to food and nutrition services. We're not asking for an amendment to this budget, but I just wanted to share with you the adopted budget um, deficit of 178,384. Some of the things that we're looking uh, at on the food services side that may impact that budget. Uh, Mr. Lewis is doing an outstanding job uh, in, in tracking that and monitoring that budget. Of course, he's facing the same supply chain challenges as everyone else is. Um, and he, he um, calculated his non-food requisition trays and he, we were seeing an increase of 589,000 just for the trays. That's not food, but that's just for the trays that we use uh, for the students. Uh, salaries increasing, uh, increase compared to budget. That's the compensation compensation increase that was approved for um, our cafeteria workers. And then an increase in federal meal reimbursement. Uh, he's monitoring that increase uh, as compared to budget as well. We're also seeing a decrease in local meal revenue with universal free, uh, free meals. That's driving down uh, that revenue that we normally see um, for local meals. Natural gas, we're not asking any uh, thing to be omitted in that budget, and this is just a snapshot of, uh, of the adopted budget, showing that there are no revisions. The debt service budget, we're not asking for revisions. We're monitoring that as well. Um, 495000 is what is the surplus that we budgeted uh, or adopted back in June. We're still looking at some of the considerations there, too. We've got upcoming uh, bond transactions transactions here in the next couple of weeks where we're selling our bond authorization. We'll have some bond refunding, bond redemptions, all of that will impact this budget. And just a little picture of our tax collections where we're seeing a slight increase over uh, 2020. Capital projects, of course, our bond work um, is here and some of our non-bond uh, capital projects are here as well. The major change to this budget that we're asking you uh, to consider tonight is $29.5 million in facility acquisitions and construction. Uh, what that is is after the audit is finalized and we know how much money we have left over from last year, uh, we then um, add it to the budget for this year. 
So that's a picture of capital projects. If you'll look at the bottom line there, the deficit at adoption time was $379 million. Um, it was not uh, included in the first budget amendment. We're proposing tonight $29.4 million, and that would leave us at $408 million. This budget is a little different because we don't put the revenue on there from our bond sales until after um, uh, the sale. And uh, Mr. Horn and his team are watching this budget closely as well. Uh, you'll see there that we are uh, having challenges there as well with rising costs of construction materials, um, the supply chain, same thing on that side of the budget, um, and of course the diminished workforce. All of that is impacting that budget as well. Mr. Horn and his team have done an outstanding job uh, with that. We're still on track um, uh, with the bond fund, so um, just wanted to share that information out. And that uh, concludes my report for tonight. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions in regard to that. Thank you very much, Mrs. Moss. Um, I will say that um, the teamwork that Dr. Hill talked about earlier, that transcends from the classroom to administration, finance. You present this report and we get the numbers, but all the work that's going on behind these numbers, uh, how fluid it is for you, ESSER funds, money we're receiving now, but we can't spend it after so many years. How do we have, thank you for all of the hard work that, that you are doing um, to make sure that we stay as financially sound uh, as possible during these difficult times. Really do appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Wilbanks. Thank you, President Mays, and, and thank you, Ms. Moss. Um, just a few quick questions. Um, on the general operating budget, um, on, um, on category um, code 51 for plant maintenance and operations, um, that $2.7 million dollars what are the big drivers? Was that primarily what you mentioned earlier in the bonus and in things that were paid out, or were there other cost drivers? Part of that is the bonus. The other part is the expenditure side of the budget for the insurance and the winter storm. So we get the revenue, expenditure. and then the expenditures. The expenditures okay. weren't all did not all happen in the 2021 budget, and so some of those expenditures are occurring here. So you see the offset. Of the two uh, about 2.4 million yes okay and so yeah okay I thought that was above and beyond and then okay but yeah now that makes sense okay and the remainder would be the one-time payment yeah and so in the next slide where you talk about uh, general operating fund uh, considerations you mention future considerations um, uh, enrollment in attendance and so um, just to be clear our deep Increase in attendance and enrollment is that that's not already updated from what was budgeted in here even though we're seeing a lower numbers there it is not and typically we don't update the budget um, right. for state revenue uh, this early on uh, but we are monitoring it uh, on a regular basis the and team we've needs. got our fingers crossed that we're going to be held harmless absolutely we so, do um, so everyone do fingers and toes uh, and on the ESSER funds, you have that listed there, but the ESSER funds that we're dividing up, the ESSER three funds that we're dividing up over the three years, those are already included in the budget, correct? Uh, in the ESSER two budget. They're not in, currently included in the general operating budget. Okay, but what, do we, what are we realistically expecting um, to accrue this year in, in this year's budget from the ESSER, total okay. ESSER funds? So that we, aren't in the budget. We considered just splitting up the S or two funds. I think that's what you're talking about. Where we're going to hold ourselves harmless uh, um, uh, as far as attendance and enrollment. Um, so it equated to about 15 million dollars a year. What we're waiting on, though, before we make that decision is: um, Are we going to be held harmless? How does it impact our bottom line? Um, you'll see where we've already. Um, added the 13.9 million in this current year, mm -hmm. uh, or our budget deficit would look 
much that was, different than it is. To be clear, that 13.9 was previous previous year. hold harmless. Okay, but in the other big chunk of money, the last big chunk of money that we have to spend over three years, that money has already been divided up and put into this budget. It has to, not been amended in the budget yet. Okay, and so that's what I'm asking about. What we realistically or ballpark can we expect? Because my guess is that that'll go. That and the hold harmless will go to wipe out that 10 million deficit that we're currently showing. Yes, yeah, so we had 59 million in ESSER 2 and that 13.9 came from ESSER 2 as well. And we were going to divide up the, the other, um, uh, the balance of that for the next three years. Okay. So you're correct, if that's what we decide to do, if we're not held harmless by TEA, uh, then it should help with that deficit. Also, when, when you look at the deficit and you're looking at it this time of year, there are certain things that we still have to look at. We're monitoring our, our uh, taxable values as well, and that comes into play. Our tax collections come into play. So we want to see where we land before we make those decisions. Okay. So we've all seen the news about um, the inflation and the scarcity of goods, and we know uh, Mr. Lewis has been impacted severe, you know, quite heavily by um, the food shortages and supplies and increases in cost, but at this time you're not recommending a modification to that budget because we are not, not of his time. great financial stewardship and and working around and, and saving money in other areas. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, and the same thing in Kelly's department on uh, the bond. And, I mean, I... You know, I think what was your note? Up to forty percent on some items, um, increasing cost thirty to forty percent for things like steel, concrete, and insulation. Um, but I guess that's not a significant uh, number in the overall construction bu budget, capital projects budget, and then therefore that's why. That's, what was the total change? Oh, twenty nine. 29 million so that was significant that's those are the primary drivers is from in inflation on that 29.4 million yes and, and and let me be clear on the 29 million that's what we had left over last year that we didn't spend that we were able to put into uh to carry over to this year's budget that's why we amended that oh okay so we we yeah because you don't have the re yes we're not we're not you're not showing revenues but yet we're carrying that money over. Yes. We didn't expect to carry over. So then we're planning to spend that money to help alleviate the inflation and other yes. increased costs. So there were projects that we had budgeted for last year, and now we're moving that budget over to this year because we didn't get to those okay. projects and didn't spend the money. So we're moving it over to current year. Okay. So it's really not increasing. No. Okay. All right. Gotcha. That's all my questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moss. Thank you, Mr. Wilbanks. I do not see any other questions. So with that, thank you once again, Ms. Moss. Thank you. And uh, President Mays, if I can, it's a team effort. Uh, I know we have a, a, a lot going on as far as school finance right now. Uh, that's why I wanted to pull it all together and, and, and show that when we talk about the budget, we talk about all budgets. And as we do these financial reports, we'll bring more to, uh, more to you as well, just for transparency purposes and uh, to share out with uh, the board and the community. Thank you. Okay, so the next thing on our agenda is our um, consent agenda items. Um, these consist of routine items grouped together for approval as one item. Unless removed from the consent agenda, these items will be acted on at one time with no discussion. Trustees, are there any requests for items to be withdrawn from the consent agenda for further discussion? I see no lights. Is there a motion to accept the agenda? I move approval. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Mr. Wilbanks, a second by Mrs. Fowler. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Okay, 
All present, vote in the affirmative, motion passes. So now we will discuss our discussion item, House Bill 3 and District Improvement Plan, Progress Monitoring Update. Dr. Cavazos? Thank you, President Mason. Uh, we bring as part of our uh, reporting and monitoring calendar, uh, House Bill 3 uh, and, and DIP uh, update uh, with our uh, performance, student performance. So, Dr. Wirtz. All right, good evening again, President Mays, members of the board, Dr. Cavazos. I'm here this evening to give our monthly update around our goals that were uh, articulated and established for House Bill 3 and the District Improvement Plan, which is currently in place. So what I'll be reporting on today is around curriculum assessments that just took place, which is CA2. And I thought I would just take a minute to um, articulate to the community what curriculum assessments are and what they're intended to do. Uh, curriculum assessments are assessments we give at the district level to monitor student performance as they progress through the scope and sequence of our curriculum in our core content areas, specifically those areas that are tested through the STAR exam. These assessments are aligned to the scope and sequence and they're cumulative in nature, but they're not comprehensive, meaning as we move from CA1 to CA2, we do hold some, we do reassess some of the objectives that were assessed in CA1 in CA2, but we don't assess everything all over again. Um, and we do that to maintain or understand how students are maintaining their mastery as they move and progress through the curriculum. Um, it is provided, as I mentioned, to star tested areas, and the intent is to provide a summative measure to how students are progressing or mastering content that's taught within the scope and sequence during a specific period of time. It's also designed to give teachers formative data as they make instructional decisions as students move through the curriculum. And then, of course, that we use it to predict future performance using psychometric properties that are established in our CA, uh, CA exams um, as we use them. So what are CA2, now that we have our CA2 assessments being um, administered, how are we progressing towards annual goals? So what I'm going to do is I will share with you um, our progress in reading and math. And I wanted to articulate um, basically how to read the first slide and then they're all uh, pretty much established in the same way. What I'll be sharing or reporting out today are only those targets that were specifically articulated um, in the board goals just for some continuity. Um, and I thought I would start off with a quote by Hugh McColl. If you're wondering who he is, he is a former executive for the Bank of America, CEO. And he said, without question, reading has been the foundation of whatever success I've had in my life. And he's had a lot of success. And I think that's really the essence of what I want to articulate tonight and why we're talking specifically around reading is because reading really lays the foundation for student success in any content area. So the first one I'm going to talk about is third grade star reading. This is the early, perform early literacy performance objective for House Bill 3. Our target over the next several years is to move from 57% to 74%. And the way you'll read these slides is pretty self-explanatory, but we articulated the baseline of where we started in 2021, um, what our goal to get to in 2022 is, which is this year. And then as we progress through each of our CAs, our benchmarks, and finally the STAR exam, um, we're trying to articulate, show you how we're actually moving. So as you can see in CA1, 55% of our students had reached the um, approaches or better mark, which is passing. And um, in CA2, we're at 63%. So if today was the day, which it's not, but if it were, today was the day, we would have exceeded our end of year target already at third grade reading, which is great. Um, and so because this is used as a predictor, we're in, we're, we're in the right trajectory, which is a good thing. This is eighth grade star reading, and I'm just going to go through the slides slowly and I'll point out a couple of things, but I'll allow you to look at them in front of you. Um, here we've dipped a little bit down. Our baseline was 67. Our end of year goal is 73. We started at 69. We're at 66, but we're going to, we're going to keep progressing. And I'm going to share with you a little bit later on down in the presentation what you typically can anticipate in terms of progress from CA1 to CA2 and how much movement you typically would see. Here's English 1. Our goal is to get to 74% by 2026. Um, our end of year target this year is 64% for all students, and we're, we exceeded that target in CA1, and we're continuing to get even better in CA2. We're at 69. In English 2, our target is 76% by August 2026. Our end of year target this year is 67, and as of CA2, we're sitting at 68%. So we're making good gains. For our district improvement plan, for the overall district reading, our goal is to get to 79%. Um, our end of year target for this year is 64. 
and we're sitting right at 64 with um, our CA2. So as you can see with reading, we're making good progress in terms of meeting our overall objectives um, across the district. I thought I would articulate some of the response, the instructional responses that we are making when it comes to um, our data. So we have, we have Office of School Leadership and campuses that are looking at their individual student data and responding to those data inside the classroom. And at the district level in our departments, we also run an item analysis, analyze our data and identify what areas and things we can do to help support that work at the campuses. I thought I would share with you, even though I'm not reiterating, I'm not sharing with you any data from screener data for K through two, but because I, I articulated those, those outcomes in previous um, the presentations, I thought I would just give you a quick update on some of the things we're still doing for K through two, even though I'm talking today really about three through eight in high school. So we are working, continue to increase our dedicated time to um, instruction in phonological awareness and phonics during classroom instruction and we're helping um, to do that by working with teachers and, and schools during content conversations. So uh, content conversations are basically previews that we do with teachers to give them a sense of what's coming in the curriculum and their units of study, um, what are typical pitfalls that kids find themselves in in that, in that um, unit of study and how you can avoid those as a classroom teacher. Um, we also have inside our um, our, uh, our instructional materials, a balanced literacy integrated planning template, which helps teachers to ensure that they're including all components of the balanced literacy uh, model in their instruction. We're also gonna continue to provide instructional resources to students as they're grouped um, using our screener tools. So when students participate in the M-Class assessment, there is a progress monitoring tool there and there's also grouping tools. So teachers can group students based on what parts of the assessment they're actually struggling with. So when they're doing small group instruction, they can customize it for the needs of the students they're working with. And then finally, um, we have added or continue to um, emphasize that they're in the curriculum documents for K through two. Um, and just as an FYI in reading, we actually integrate reading and social studies together in the primary grades. Um, we have an explanation about um, the Fountas and Pinnell phonics spelling and word study um, kits in there so teachers know and, um, um, know and have a reference to that resource as they work on this instruction in the classroom and then of course providing um, professional learning to teachers as they work on uh, integrating phonics lessons into their classroom. In three through eight, uh, we are leveraging uh, our coaching conversations to really help them as they work with teachers in, um, in their in their using their data to drive instruction in the classroom. Um, coaching conversations, just so you know, we each of our campuses have coaches in our professional learning department, we have a coaching department and they work with our instructional coaches. And one of the things we've talked a lot about is it's important not only understand the process of coaching, but you have to understand the content too so you can marry those two things together. In other words, if I'm going to coach a literacy teacher, a teacher in literacy, um, I have to understand the, how to teach literacy in order to do that coaching. Um, so in, in grades three through eight, um, it's their coaching conversations are primarily around um, using iStation data because we have a transition to M class. In primary grades, M class is what you see in front of you. Um, but we are moving towards M class in future um, years, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. For iStation progress monitoring, we, I, as a point of reference, um, students who take iStation also receive, um, it's, it basically uses an artificial intelligence to move kids into lessons that are based on their individual needs. Um, we had over, as of last, earlier this week, we had up to 10,000 students who have logged in. So we know that they're actually utilizing the resource to help, which is a, a good thing. It also provides interventions specifically customized towards what kids' needs are, and teachers can leverage these interventions to help them as they work with kids on their Hospital 4545 um, tutoring. And then in seventh and eighth grade, we are continuing with our strategy around close reading and um, pushing in our content conversations at the campus to help teachers as they implement that strategy. And then some other just generalized um, reading um, instructional responses we have, as you know, this is just a reminder, our comprehensive literacy and math frameworks. Uh, and we continue to help teachers think about those guidelines as they structure their, their lessons. Uh, we are pre prepping for the transition to M class in the upper grades three through eight this summer. Uh, but we do have one school, Fitzgerald Elementary, who is piloting that in grades three through five as part of the Raising Blended Learners Grant. And so I only highlight that there to, for you to know that we're, in, we're kind of in that process of working um, through that, um, that transition. 
And then finally, we do have a cohort of campuses that are continuing to work with an expert that we have contracted with for several years, Audrey Bragg. She's a balanced literacy expert, and she works with campuses in professional learning and the implementation of that model in the classroom. And then we have a, a resource that teachers have access to called Newsomatic, and what that does is it provides over 10,000 articles um, that are at different Lexile levels, so uh, students can access um, science and social studies and a different cross-curricular kind of text as they're um, learning in the reading classroom, but ensuring that that text is not only at their instructional level, but also at their independent levels. Next, I'm gonna go over mathematics, and there is a, a, a statistician named William Paul Thurston who said mathematics is not about numbers, equations, computations, or algorithms, it is about understanding. And I think I have learned more about that as I've collaborated with Dr. Lopez and uh, the form of Dr. Barlow, um, more than anything, numbers are really numbers, but they're actually there telling a story, and I thought this quote really articulated that, and we want kids to see math in the same light. So I'm gonna go through the same slides that you saw structurally for uh, reading, and I'll talk to you a little about math. Um, just as you mentioned earlier this evening, math is still a struggle. The gaps in math were really significant, and um, they continue to be significant, and we're, we're making progress, but you're gonna notice that the math kind of looks very much the same. It's a little growth here, and then in some places it dips a little. So third grade math, the positive thing is we're making progress. So our goal is to get to 52, and we went from 43 to 48, and now our goal is to keep going through, through our benchmark and star. Our target by 2026 is back to 73, which is our baseline. In eighth grade, um, star math, we are really pretty much holding steady. 1%, you really, you, it's, there's not a lot of growth, obviously, any at all, or um, it's not a lot of decline. Our target is to get to 57%. Um, percent. I will say, just as a reminder, eighth grade math is the area we took the largest hit with STAR, and there is a lot of ground to cover, so it was a very aggressive goal to begin with, but um, we're still working at it. Algebra 1, we made some progress. We moved from 58 to 62%. Our target is to get to 81% by August of 2026. One thing I'd like to just point out here is that these are the students that took eighth grade math last year. So it's, it's, um, it's positive for us to see that they're actually doing better as they move into Algebra 1, even though we saw so many, so many struggles in eighth grade math. And then finally, our overall math objective, um, we're sitting right about 50%. So we went up a little bit, but we still have some ground to go because our um, target this year is 58. Now, one of the questions we often get, well, okay, so it's CA1 to CA2. How does this progress typically look from year to year? Um, and so I thought I'd provide a slide that would just show you how it usually looks. These, this is uh, an our, a slide that articulates what our, our all groups look like in 2020, 2021, 2022 in CA1 and what it looked like in CA2. And you can see you see similar trends. And the only reason I bring that up to you is just so there's not a lot of fret. This is what typically happens. You notice more things happening when you get to benchmark, which is right getting ready to get started in February. Not a ton that changed between CA1 and CA2. And the reason that is is because the number of skills that you're assessing in CA1 and CA2 is much more, um, it's, it's much shorter, it's much smaller. When you do a benchmark, you're actually using a release STAR exam. So it's a STAR exam that students took in a prior year. We literally print it out and we, well, we don't necessarily print it out, but they retake that exam. So you, you, in the benchmark, you're giving them a summative exam that covers everything for an entire school year. And even though sometimes in the benchmark, students don't do very well on certain points, like certain uh, objectives, we don't fret over that either because we can look at the scope and sequence and say, well, we never even got to that. But with CA1 and CA2, it's shorter, um, their tests are shorter, they cover less um, ground in terms of, of the curriculum to measure, and so you're going to see less movement um, between the two places. And the last thing I'll point out is the amount of time between CA1 and CA2 is very, very short but there is a chunk of time between when school starts and benchmark happens. You're getting through the majority of the school year. So what are some of these instructional responses that we're focusing on in, uh, in, across math and science? So I, I threw uh, sixth grade in here, even though sixth grade is not articulated, but just because it impacts other areas. So one of our, our primary objectives when it comes to mathematics is really focusing on the CRA um, 
strategy. And CRA basically means you're helping students transition in mathematics from the concrete to the representational, which is illustrations, to the abstract, which is the algorithm. And so we've been focusing on the CRA model in sixth grade and working with the executive directors from Tracy, Dr. Brown's department, to really develop action plans to help um, uh, really work with sixth grade teachers as they, as they work through some of their challenges. Also, the same thing with Algebra 1 and Biology. There are comprehensive plans for um, working with teachers during the PLC time in both those two content areas to really help address um, some of the progress that we need to see in those two content areas in high school. And then, of course, just the general response is uh, we're continuing to provide training on intervention groups using math inventory, which is our screener in mathematics. And we've embedded intervention documents in, into our curriculum. And I'm going to show you in the next slide an example of what that looks like um, for algebra and third grade. We also have had over 18 math inventory sessions provided um, to help inform instructional classrooms in the classroom. And those started in August. So we've had 18 over the course of semester one. And then we are working with um, Region 11 to implement what's called Accelerated Mathematics Proficiency. It's their AMP program. And, and in essence, what it does is it creates a customized learning pathway to teach instructional mathematics to students in the classroom based upon where they, where they are in terms of their proficiency. And then finally, of course, Imagine Math, that we have that available to use as an intervention. And we have pathways articulated in our curriculum documents as how you can, how you can um, what, what you can use in terms of interventions in your curriculum documents should you find students have struggles with different points. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what that looks like. So here, uh, and what you see in front of you is an example of our curriculum assessment to intervention form for um, third grade math, a, a snippet of it, and then algebra one. And in essence, what it does is it looks at the item on the assessment. We look at the standard that was actually taught, what are the concepts that students need to know, and then what are some optional interventions you can use depending on whether your students struggle with those concepts or not. And that is available for students. The two examples I have here are algebra and math, but they're in the other areas as well. Here is also an example of a companion document. So as you know, we're in, we use text resource systems as our, text resource system as our primary core curriculum for grades three through um, 12. And so uh, we design and develop our own companion documents that help teachers make sense of some of the resources we have in our system that are not part of TRS. Um, so what you see in front of you is the third grade math companion document. And what you'll notice on here are two things I want to point out. One is um, the priority instructional content and resources. So basically, we call that the picker. And if you'll remember at the very beginning of the school year, we, I mentioned that the curriculum department was working to identify what are the priority standards and things to pay attention to in a unit of study. We highlight those things there. And then also, there is a section for interventions and extensions. So students who are struggling with specific concepts, there's recommendations for interventions you can do during your classroom time. And if you have students that are ready to move on and be extended, there's, op there's options for that as well. Finally, last but not least, um, what we've noticed in a system this large, I always compare it to trying to turn a, um, a cruise ship. It's really hard. And a lot of the, th the challenge comes from just being in the know. Uh, if you were to go into the text resource system and look at our curriculum, there are so many resources, it's almost like daunting. And so one of the things that I've been talking to the curriculum department about is how can we do little commercials, just bite-sized things that help people know really quickly, hey, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna pay attention to a lot of things, this one document is real helpful. So what we've been doing is we've been doing a couple of things. During our ILA with principals, we do these, we, we literally call them commercials. One of them actually physically made a commercial and then actually Dr. Lopez did one that was fantastic, which was a commercial about how to do an item analysis. Um, and then we also have some, um, new communication that's going out. So there's, um, there's, in being, it's, there's in the know communication that's coming out of Dr. Brown's office. We're collaborating with her office to make sure that information gets sent out to principals. We're highlighting things in the MyASD newsletter. Um, and we're just trying to make sure that it's not a lot of information that would be so overwhelming you wouldn't want to look at it. It's really just bite-sized, quick, and, um, and easy for teachers. Um, the other thing about it, too, is we're providing continuous training to campus leadership on really understanding the curriculum documents so that there's um, alignment between how teachers are designing for instruction in the classroom and what the curriculum is calling for. 
and then of course working with our our, our coaches as 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 we as you know we're working with outside coaches to help us with best practices in reading mathematics what we want to make sure those coaches do is that they're articulating what resources are available to teachers as they're working with them um, and so we've been working and doing some training with that group because um, our curriculum is unique to us and then finally uh, what's coming in March is we do boot camp sessions um, and so those are actually in design and boot camps are basically um, it, resources we provide to teachers as they try to get kids geared up and ready for the star exam as a last ditch effort when you're really close to the finish line and you're, you kind of want to get there. The last thing I wanted to articulate is some of the things that are coming out of the Office of School Leadership. There are four main things that I, I'm going to share tonight. Tier teacher support, data talks, lesson alignment and um, formative feedback, formative assessment, which is known as LAFA, and then some of the best practices work. So when it comes to tiered support, the executive directors um, that are in Dr. Brown's office are individually working with the instructional leadership teams at each of the campuses and supporting them in a very individualized, differentiated way. And the one thing I would say that's very positive about that is um, because their uh, bandwidth is tighter with fewer schools to really have to support, um, the, the quality of differentiation is, can be very, very high. And they've been doing an awesome job um, providing opportunities for us to even collaborate with them so that when we create responses to their needs at campuses, um, the two sides of the house, the academic services side and the Office of School Leadership can work in sync with one another. Um, there are data teacher, um, teacher data meetings that are happening um, in, during the PLCs where um, there's support for teachers in terms of developing their instructional plans in ways that are differentiated for kids. Um, DDI coaching is still um, is continuing as part of it's, um, the TEAL process that we've been working on with Region 11. That coaching is happening with uh, coaches and the, and the principals, the EDs and the principals, um, and helping schools really leverage that that, 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 that process or that model to understand what kids need as they're designing instruction. And then of course the, the tiered support for teachers in terms of side-by-side -side planning and modeling. Just like students, we all have strengths and we all have areas to grow and so we want to make sure that the support we provide to our instructional staff is differentiated for their own needs as well. Another one are our data talks. So students are doing their own tracking of their own goals. We feel like it's super important that students understand where they are in their learning progression and take responsibility for their learning. Um, DDI implementation, like I mentioned. And then the last one that I want to just draw your attention to is our progress around House Bill 4545 tutoring. Um, there has been significant collaboration between Specialized Learning Services, which is Ms. Bustamante and, and um, Julie McGuire out of Office of Federal, State and Federal Programs, and Dr. Buell from Office of School Leadership, and really putting together a system that's really strong so that we know exactly which students need it, how much time they've been receiving their tutoring, are they making progress, um, and it's, it's really, it's, 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 they've done a great job and it's, a, it's been a monumental task, so I'd like to give some kudos to them. The Strategic Support Network, which is a network of schools that are probably our most need, needy in terms of needing significant um, assistance, have been implementing a few specific strategies. One is LAFA, and this is um, coaching they're receiving from Region 11 to really think about how they um, make sure their lessons are aligned and that they're leveraging the data from their formative assessments to design the differentiated lessons. Um, in essence, while this sounds like something different, it is very much aligned to the best practices that we've been talking about. Um, they've also been um, focusing on evidence of their implementation of the target improvement plans that each of them have inside at their schools. And then, of course, there's the, the, the support from the instructional facilitators and other members of the school improvement team that go out. And then finally, really working on focusing on the priority standards um, when they're planning for instruction so that they, the schools can make sure they're really hitting the targets um, or the standards that are the most significant in terms of each of the units of study. And then last but not least is just a, a reiteration of our continued focus around reading and mathematics coaching around the four best practices. Um, principals also do what we call triad walks where they independently in their triads um, without their supervisor just with each other as a collaborative group go and walk classrooms in each other's schools to look at best practice, to talk about what they're seeing, to think about implementation to support one another in their work. Um, and then, of course, the executive directors support them through their learning community meetings. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the instructional facilitators are actually on, out on campuses every day. So what does this look like in terms of accountability? So I, I mentioned CA2. 
But the question we always ask ourselves is if today was the day, what would it look like? So if, you were to, if we were to be rated today based on our CA2 results, right now we would be sitting at an overall district grade of a 72. And that's what we have. Any questions I can answer for you? Thank you very much, Dr. Wirtz. Do I have any trustees with any questions, comments? Yes, Mrs. McMurray. Thank you, Dr. Wirtz. Um, my favorite two practices that you mentioned in regards to literacy and then math was guided reading mm -hmm. and um, the focus on a multitude of interventions for math because the, the best analogy that made sense to me ever as an educator was literacy, especially fluency and comprehension, it's like paving a path. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this, right. just read. The more you read, you know, that gets boosted. But with math, it's more like building a wall. Mm -hmm. If you're missing the bricks down at the bottom, you can't continue. You have to address that foundation. So these practices really hit home in regards to addressing that. Guided reading moves all readers mm -hmm. from your highest flyer to your student who's reading, you know, much below grade level, everyone's moving forward. Um, so that's great that that's an emphasis. Um, I do want to ask a question about the math interventions. Can we go back to the slide um, that had an example of the companion document? I think it oh, was. Oh, sure. So this is a very um, comprehensive list of interventions that mm -hmm. pertain to this pocket of, of the pacing. Um, where within, and I'm assuming this would look different at the elementary versus high school level, but where within the instructional day where these interventions take place? Because we know the curriculum train and the grade level takes, that train's not stopping. Right. Um, so where will this really take flight? So that's a good question, and there are two places it can happen. I want to first lean, on to, lean in on your first comment, which is in the mathematics classroom, it is exactly as you described, which is you got to build the wall from the bottom up, so to speak. So part of that is in in the actual 90-minute math block, in our math framework, we have a 90-minute math block outline about how you would design your instruction. And if I was a teacher and I knew my kids were struggling with building blocks as they are working through their own learning pathways, I might embed in those pathways some specific interventions to catch some of them up, or I may even leverage it as part of my guided math group because guided math is also one of our things. Number talks, guided math. The other part is we have I and E time. So we have an intervention and an enrichment time. And basically that is 30 minutes of time set aside in mathematics every day where a student can have customized differentiated learning for them based upon wherever they are. And so um, the interventions could take place there as well. The challenge really is not around I and E is so much at the elementary level, even though if I'm just being totally frank, um, that. It, there is a lot to do in a very short amount of time in elementary and you're, you have so many preps. Yeah. But in secondary, you have a 90 minute math block or I'm gonna say a 90 minute period and uh, it's, it, it's not articulated as cut and dry as mm -hmm. you would in elementary because we have an I and E time there and there and, and in secondary they address it a little differently. So in secondary, we still map out what we think is a recommended way that you would address instruction during the 90 minute math period but we're still recommending through our best practices that that would still happen in the same way, small group instruction, um, which is in many classrooms very, very necessary and the only place where that's actually gonna take place if it wasn't included in tutoring. Absolutely, um, thank you for that. And then can we go back to the slide with the eighth grade star reading data? Um, yes. With CA1 and CA2. And I guess my question would, would really apply to beyond eighth grade, but does this take into account our students' performance on the revising and editing? So we have, so that's a good question. So for those of you that don't know, the reading exam is being redesigned at the state level. And so what we did is we still offered revising and editing multiple choice mm -hmm. as a CA in our sequence. We had reading, like normal reading, and we had writing multiple choice that we offered during C, uh, during this period. Um, 
what, what, which, what you're referring to is that there's also a constructed response portion, um, which is the old composition. Mm -hmm. We did not include that at, right at that moment. That actually happened last week. So we as a district have still um, administered assessments in writing for both the written composition portion um, and we did a constructive response on our side. So we, in the way the constructive response that works a little different in old writing, it used to be in fourth and seventh grade, you would get a prompt that would say something to the effect of, talk about the time you made a new friend, and then they would write. Um, I'm using that as a, and that actually was a prompt one year. Um, <laughs> now, what the, this, what the state will be doing is they'll be taking a reading passage that is cross-curricular in nature, so it may be they're reading a science concept or a social studies concept and they're gonna be reading a passage and then they're gonna be asked a question to respond to that passage in a more um, rigorous way to be truthful. And so what our thought was is if you don't assess writing in a meaningful way, we will find ourselves in a scenario where kids are struggling with writing because we didn't embed it in the right way. So to respond to your question, what we did is we had the multiple choice available to, for, for students to take and teachers could use that data we weren't collecting at the system level because there is no account, there is no writing test this year, but we wanted teachers to know how their students were writing. And then that was just during regular CAs. And then in a separate week all together, we also gave them access to what we call, uh, to a, a locally designed, we created it, because um, we don't have the blueprint yet, we just have the samples from the state, um, a constructed response so that they could try it. The important thing to know, just to, for, if you, for those of you that may not know is, Writing is no longer going to be a, like a fourth and seventh grade thing. It's a three through eight thing. So it'll be embedded in reading. When you take reading, you'll also be taking a revising and editing portion of writing, and you'll be taking a constructed response. In high school, English one and two, we've always had constructed response. They're just called open, an open response answers. Like they would ask them a question. They'd have to write an answer as part of their exam. That's going to be new for three through eight. And so to answer your question, yes, as a way of prepping, because we have to have some sense of understanding about, or teachers at least in campuses, about how they're doing. Right. Um, if I can just add one more thing, because you kind of got me on the passionate topic, because we literally talked about this even just the other day with my team, um, is as we move into the subject with, um, as we're moving down, the, down this semester, is making sure we're providing teachers with an understanding about how to understand whether that writing actually looks good or not. We have very limited information. We know that it's gonna be scored on a five point scale, but we don't necessarily know, we haven't seen the rubric yet. So the more information we get, we'll, we'll run that out. When we have next year's CAs, it'll all be in there because we, we know we're gonna have a writing in our reading next year. Well, and that's what I was really hoping for. I would like to align our district assessments to our state assessment as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I see that we're covering all the pieces, but weaving together one assessment, one literacy assessment mm -hmm. as the state is doing, not only does the tr this trim down our number of assessment days, mm -hmm. which I'm a huge fan of right. because we need instructional days leading up to STAR and just because it's right. what's best for kids, um, but also, this aligns with the moves the state is making. Right. So how will this year's benchmark be formatted with it'll, um, reading? It'll be aligned to the way they're going to take STAR this year. And that's the same reason why the CAs were designed the way they were separated, because we're trying to create the thing we don't have is we don't have any psychometrics on the writing in the reading the way it's going to look. So even next year when we do our CAs and our, we won't have any way of predicting outcomes because we don't have a baseline point. This year we know our CAs do show predictive value towards the star the way it's currently designed for reading. So our CAs are written in the and designed in the way they're going to be taking star in the spring this year and next year we'll write them for the way they're going to take spring next year. So. To answer your question, benchmark, they'll be taking reading the way it's actually going to be delivered this year. We're not going to be integrating writing into the reading um, for the benchmark exam because it's not going to help us in predicting how they're going to perform in reading this year, but it will help us in the future. We do, we still will assess writing. We still want teachers to have the access to the data to plan for it, but we don't want to mix the data to create a scenario where we can't really interpret it because we're thinking, oh, their reading scores are lower. Well, they're not really going to be lower for this year's STAR. They're lower because we integrated something that they're not going to be held accountable to. Right. Yeah. Um, does that include the revising and editing passages, though? Yeah, like so reading the way it looks this year is the way the benchmarks will look this year. Does that make sense? Like yes. Like, wh whatever is going to be included in STAR this year is the way their benchmarks will look like in February. Okay, yeah. great. And one more question. Um, remind me, does CA2 assess TEKS taught up until that point from the beginning of school year, or 
is it only standards that have been um, taught between CA1 and CA2? No, it includes some that all the way from the beginning, but not it's not comprehensive. It's not we don't go from the very beginning and just redo everything all over again. We we teach what was taught between CA1 and CA2, and we grab a few of the standards from CA1 and we embed them in. And the only reason we have to do that is otherwise we would create long assessments, and there is not a real appetite for that. Um, it would be, to be honest, the longer the assessments are, the more information it actually yields to the teacher, but um, it does what you're, you have to balance between that and classroom time and all that, so Absolutely, it and our teachers still have something like That's a timeline where they're very clear on what standards will be assessed on each assessment, right? Yes, they are, okay. and the other thing about it too is they, they also, which we, we can't, we, as a district, we only collect data around the CAs, right, and benchmarks, but the reality is, is the curriculum is full of formative assessments. Right. Teachers can assess their kids along the way around mastery. So even if we don't grab it, it doesn't mean the kids aren't necessarily mastering it. Teachers are taking care of that part. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Mrs. McMurray. Mr. Wilbanks. Thank you, President Mays. And um, just a couple of comments. And, um, you know, you know, what we've seen and what we've heard nationally is you know, math, uh, reading, not as much as a problem as math, and where we are, where we were with CA1 and CA2, um, bore that out, it, you know, it, third grade reading, great, we're on track to our HB3 goals. Um, you know, on the eighth grade reading, I noticed there was a drop. Have we done any kind of analysis to kind of figure out why the scores drop? And it was great that you put in that chart that showed what we normally expect year to year comparison or from CA1 to CA2. Right. Um, but is there anything to be concerned of, you know, say on our eighth grade reading and since there was a decline, we didn't see that increase that we saw in third grade. Well, um, so the answer to your question is yes, there has been, we have done an item analysis, um, which does a couple of things. Um, the way we look at our item analysis is we, um, thanks to Dr. Lopez's work, we have what we call, um, a, we have a document that basically helps us understand um, the level of difficulty that a question is, is designed and there are psychometrics behind it. Because mm -hmm. um, when you take the exam, as we mentioned before, there are questions that are written in a way that everyone should get them right. And then there are questions that you actually design for the majority for people not to get right. And that's how you start to distinguish between your high achievers and the ones that are kind of in between. And so the way that we label them at the state level is approaches, meets, and masters. And so Dr. Lopez did the same thing. So what we do is we are able to take that document, look at the questions and the level of difficulty, identify those items that majority of kids should be passing or, or should not have missed, and then re-look at the questions, try to understand what the problem may be, and, what, and make some discussions about whether it's a curricular issue, whether we need to provide additional support and redesign some of our content conversations to help them with that. So to answer your question, yes, we do know what the, the challenges were. I don't have them right here in front of me, specifically around eighth grade math, but the curriculum department has analyzed it to try to understand like what the problem could have been in terms of the relationship to how they performed on the individual questions and the concepts connected to those questions. Um, I could tell you from um, that document we know how pervasive it was, how, what percentage of kids missed that whole concept across the district, do we need to spiral that in our curriculum earlier, do we need to make some adjustments. Um, that's the way we use the assessments to respond at the district level in terms of the curriculum department. So yes, we have that, I just don't have it in front of me. Yeah, yeah and then, then of course, yeah. the one step further is, you know, if it was something where we needed to go back and reteach or be more, of, there is time for intervention, we're applying that. Oh, absolutely, to, yeah. Uh, so that we can, those students can be prepared or have ever, every opportunity to be prepared. Well, and the other thing too that I, that I mentioned earlier that's really helpful is with Dr. Brown's group, the EDs, who are working with their individual learning communities, when they notice the content area at a grade level that's really struggling or there's a problem, they're working with the curriculum department to design an action plan that's customized for that learning community so that we can actualize change yeah. there. Um, and that's been very that's good. beneficial, yeah. Yeah, good. All right, so my next question on reading is, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, effort with the reading academies that were required with HB3 or in that legislative session. 
um, applying the science of reading and not necessarily the balanced literacy framework that we use. Um, and I notice we're spending a lot of time on phonetic awareness and some of the things that are outlined in those, what, five domains um, of, of that. Are we starting to see payoff with that increased focus on the science of reading that the, that the teachers are trained on with the reading academies, or is it too early to tell? I haven't had an, I haven't, we haven't done any analysis specifically pulling the data for teachers who actually participated and finished the academy versus those that didn't to see if there's a difference in achievement. We can run that. We haven't done that yet. So that's a good idea. Um, I will say that um, the learning that they have around the science of reading, um, the only difference between that and the balanced literacy model is it is, it is, you leverage the science of teaching reading in balanced literacy, you just put it in a structure with balanced literacy, but it's, you don't necessarily do different things, you just do it in a structured way. It's kind of the way I think about active learning cycle versus best practices. You have the best practices active learning cycle just organizes when and how you do them, and that's kind mm -hmm. of the same idea. So what we could do, and I think that's actually a really good idea, um, Regardless of how well we're doing, um, we're still going to have to do it, but the idea would be to how do we support people in their implementation of it if I can know whether it's making a difference or not. So we can do that. It's, it's only reason it's a little early for this year's cohorts because they're still going through it. Um, and last year, um, it, it was all online and they were all at, you know, um, at home during COVID. But yeah. I, I think it's worth the effort to do that, and we, totally, we could completely do that. I just hadn't thought about that, to be honest. So it's yeah. a good idea. It'd be interesting to see yeah, the effectiveness on it, and if we need to I think so too. double down on some of those things. Yeah. Um, and so you, I was a little, um, I'm, it's been a while since I took notes on this and you covered it, but you talked about moving to um, in class to provide a, uh, when you were talking about in class, you talked about the ability to use artificial intelligence to provide um, highly personalized um, um, adaptive learning mm -hmm. to meet each kid where they are in reading. Is that correct? We do that right now for iStation. Oh, and that's M in iStation. Mm -hmm. And then in M class. Um, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, correct me. You, thanks for correcting me. My question was this, are we, you're, you do that now in iStation, will you have that same ability in M class? Um, I, I, I know the in-class tools look a little different. I don't, I don't know if it's at the same exact level. I have to go look, that, look into that. Um, M-class is a little more customized in that there's more teacher interaction on M-class than there is necessarily on um, iStation. iStation is independently done using the software system, whereas M-class actually the teacher is, is leveraged as part of that process. Um, but there is um, progress monitoring and um, customized grouping that happens there. Um, I know that there is a software system that we've talked about in, in, my, in the curriculum department um, to respond to students in that way. I just can't remember off the top of my head um, the name of it, but uh, I, I believe the answer is yes. I just, I'm, it's slipping my mind to be honest. Okay. Well, my final question is this, and it's a big one. I don't want to put you on the spot, but now that we've been at CA1, now that you have CA2, I don't know who, if it was me or someone asked this, you know, several times before. What keeps you up at night now that you've seen the CA2 results? What are the big, <coughs> big concerns for you? Um, <coughs> it's not a specific standard. Um, the thing that keeps me up at night is the stuff we've been talking about the rest of the meeting, to be honest, because that's what's preventing the numbers from moving the way you want it to. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many times Dr. Brown and I have had this conversation and Dr. Cavazos and I have had this conversation. There's so, we're in such a weird time in our history um, that you have all these outside things that you can't control that are causing issues to the things that you want to control and you can't fix those problems. So you just mitigate them the best that you can. And as you can see from our conversations tonight, it gets down to something as basic as, do I have a teacher standing in front of students? It's part of the reason why academic services is going into schools to sub is because we've talked as a team. We can do all this work, but if I don't have a teacher standing in front of that student, then it is for naught. And so if, I, if you really wanna know what keeps me up at night, that's it. It's, it's, I'm, we're trying to, it's not the standards, it's all that I know if I can get teachers teaching them that they'll get there. It's just the world is creating so many challenges to just show up. Um, right. And so that's that's really what it is, to be honest. Yeah, and yeah. that's my concern too. In fact, I think 
uh, we were joking um, earlier, uh, Mr. Hogg suggested, maybe it's time we all as trustees sign up as subs to go into the classroom. <laughs> Uh, because we know there's a big need there to prevent everything that's going on in the outside world from derailing our plans to get these kids back on track. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I told him I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> it's time to roll up our sleeves. So thank you, Dr. Wirtz. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wilbanks. Are there any other questions? Thank you once All again, right, Dr. Wirtz. So the next discussion item on our agenda is the TASB Board Policy Update, 118, Policy CDA Local and Policy EF Local. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mays. And this evening we bring uh, for a discussion uh, policy uh, updates. Uh, and as customary, we bring the discussion one meeting and then we bring it to action uh, for action the other one. Dr. Hill will summarize, and also Mr. Chapa and the Governance Committee has uh, taken a deep dive in these as well. So, Dr. Hill. All right, thank you. And we'll get right into this update. Again, this is not new to us. Uh, just a little background policy, Update 118, uh, encompasses both legal and local policies that are recommended from TASB, and administration uh, recommends some revisions to CDA and EF local for your consideration. Uh, again, the legal updates or the changes in laws, legal policies should not be adopted, only reviewed by administration and the board. The local policies need board uh, action to actually adopt, revise, or repeal any local policies. Update 118 has 132 policies total, 120 are from the legal aspect and, and 12 are from local. And again, CDA and EF are recommended from administration. The process thus far has included uh, uh, the appropriate staff reviewing these policies, the Board Governance Committee uh, reviewing these policies, our legal team has looked at them, and we've also had some conversation with TASB regarding uh, what some of our recommendations are. Just a closer look at some of the policies, and again, you had this, uh, these handouts, I won't go into all the detail, but just to highlight some of the 132 policies. Uh, one dealing with accountability. Uh, Details uh, regarding accountability performance ratings have been added from the Senate Bill 1365 that reflects the uh, no ra not rated and the D ratings. Uh, some clarification about uh, election, the process for elections and runoffs. Uh, the another policy here about uh, other revenues and basically House Bill 1525 requires that a district accept donations from a parent, teacher organization, or an, or an association to fund supplemental uh, educational staff positions. That's just a, a law that's changed. Again, I won't go through all of these, just a few of them. Uh, we'll look at one that talks about special programs. EHBB uh, eliminates the requirement for the district to annually certify its gifted uh, program to, TE, to the commissioner. Uh, student activities at FM prohibits the district from excluding a student from participation in UL because that student uh, receives outpatient mental health services. Uh, there's another one that I wanted to share, some legal ones, some local ones here. So just about account accounting and activity funds, a clarification that student activity funds are raised and collected by student organizations and the expendis expending those funds uh, rests with the student organizations with administrative oversight. Uh, C CQB talks about the elimination of annual training except for the, the cybersecurity coordinator. Uh, there's another one that I wanted to bring attention to because we talked about it a little bit today in one of the presentations, and that is uh, FEC provides an exception. No, that's, no, that is, uh, provides an exception for the 90% rule for certain situations uh, that students may be in and it really focuses on mastery of the content versus seat time. And I thought that was a good one that would really be able to impact some of the work that we're doing and the challenges that we have now. Uh, this, these are the two local policies that our administration are bringing for recommendation, uh, other revenues and investments, and that's lengthening the uh, allowed maturity of certain investments from one year to two years. And then the instructional resources, this revision basically provides a standard for the, dist for the district uh, for any procedures that are challenging some instructional materials, just puts that in a more standard form uh, and leaves less to chance for uh, inconsistency. 
So our next steps are to continue to review these legal and local policies and their impacts within the district and within the different various departments and bring them back for consideration for your approval at the February 3rd uh, board meeting. As Dr. Cavazos mentioned, we've had a meeting with the governance committee. They've kind of given some feedback on some of these policies and uh, we'll have any questions that you may have for us today or the governance committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Mr. Chapa. Thank you, President Mays. I don't have much to add to, to Dr. Hill's presentation. Uh, as with many of these policy updates, many of these are just technical in nature, reflect updates to existing laws and procedures or just streamlining. Um, so with that, I'll just, if there are any specific questions, um, I may be able to answer some, but probably we'll turn it over to Dr. Hill. Um, and if not, we can move on. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Mr. Hogg? Ms. Chapa, move on. I agree with you 100%. Let me, let me just ask one little thing, because I, I think most of these policies are, are right on. Um, you know, some good things of allowing students to get their driver's permit and some of those things. L let me just ask one, Mr. Hill, tiny technical question, just because I go through this, read it, look at all the red lines, and they're critical. On, like, near the back is, is one example on FL Local A. Um, we have them in blue, the new text, and then the red text, and it's the exact same thing. <laughs> that could there, just that's be like in four or five spots. So I'm just, yeah. that's literally my technical question is all I'm asking is, and we've had that in the past, and I think I was tired the last time and I didn't ask. Yeah. So I'm just asking about and that And unfortunately, it's probably going to be in the future ones too. We asked TASB about that, and it's some sort of editing software that is, they can't explain it. <laughs> I, I, that's literally what they told they're me. Having, they're having a hard time explaining a lot of things right now this time of the year. So um, uh, that's fine. But I, it's all cleaned up once we. Yeah, yeah. I, I just read through it. I'm like, I like read it. I probably read that five times because yeah. I'm like, it looks the same. What am I missing on there? Um, and then I think I can't spell, and that's probably a realistic thing. So um, that, that was my only question. Thank you, the Governance Committee. Um, we always have to be diligent on these TASB policies to make sure. They match with our district. I think these are on board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hogg. Thank you once again to our governance committee, um, Justin Chapa, Chair, Melody Fowler, and Sarah McMurrah. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Appreciate it. Okay, next thing on our agenda is our open forum for non-agenda items. Ms. Benjamin, do we have any requesters registered to address? Okay. So we have no registered speakers, so we will move on on our agenda. Superintendent's report, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Mason. I've got uh, some items to share about our district. So uh, congratulations, first and foremost, to our very own Coach Anthony Chris. Uh, Coach Chris recently stepped away from coaching and is now working uh, at Carter Junior High and is being honored by the Texas High School Coaches Association with its Coaching Beyond the Game Award next month. Coach Chris, who uh, has coached for many years, uh, but spent the last 11 as head coach at Sam Houston High School, is being honored for his impact on his team, school, and community because of his passion and commitment to coach beyond the game. Coach Chris will give a speech, which if you haven't heard him speak, this may be a great opportunity. Um, at the organization's uh, leadership summit that happens to be in Arlington uh, at the end of February. So you see his picture there. Congratulations to Coach Chris for all his accomplishments and his tenure with our district and his impact on young people over many years. Uh, so congratulations to Coach Chris. More congratulations are in order to another AISD employee. This time it's Barry Elementary librarian Carol Hughes. We want to recognize her if we can catch her. Uh, Hughes, it's written here, so I got to give credit to whoever wrote this. So, yeah, that's not mine. It's, uh, but anyway, uh, Hughes has been at Barry since 2016 and ran the Philadelphia Marathon in November. While running one marathon, it's a huge accomplishment. It's really nothing for her. That's because that marathon marked the 50th for Miss Hughes. Uh, Hughes is also able to use her running to inspire readers at the school. She uses her experience to try to get students to stretch themselves and that the more they practice at anything, the more the results they will see. So congratulations to Ms. Hughes. 
you drive down North Cooper you recently, or you've driven by North Cooper recently, you'll see Webb Elementary. And of course, it's been there, but you'll see the new Webb coming up. And it's reached a milestone that it's, it's going vertical. Uh, steel frame is now up. Uh, and so you can see the skeleton of that uh, building. And it's a really exciting time for Webb. It's, uh, as, you, as everyone knows, it's part of our rebuilding of, some, of schools that have aged facilities. And I often say that when the school is being built and the students are uh, seeing that school being built, it's really, really a, a phenomenal experience because eventually, uh, depending on their age and their grade level, they'll be in the new school. So they see it with anticipation just like we do and our community does. So again, a big thank you to all our community, the 2019 bond uh, and the voters for making this possible. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank Ella Bees and all the partners who helped put on a generous hands holiday give back dinner last month. Uh, we were fortunate to be one of the, the servers at the event. Many of us participated in that. Uh, it was a great uh, part of the night, especially considering uh, that the evening benefited more than 100 people involved in the district's families and transition program, and they were able to enjoy dinner. Uh, and our students left with toys, shoes, and groceries for their families. Thank you to everyone. Thanks to the uh, parent, and, uh, parent and Community Engagement Department, Aaron Perales, Mr. Phillips, and others, uh, everyone who was there. And uh, a special thank you to, uh, is it Joe Looney? Is that right, Michael? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe Looney from the Dallas Cowboys, as you see pictured there. Uh, he was, um, as he has joined our schools before and has awarded our teachers and his representatives of the Dallas Cowboys, um, and he's just an excitable person and fun to be around. Um, he, carry a lot of plates. he carries a lot of plates yeah. and he helped us out because he carried them all. Um, so we were just uh, very happy to be there and, and making sure that, that uh, our families felt supported. So thank you for everybody who participated. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Cavazos. And you forgot to say, and Santa Claus left with a massage card that we put together for him. <laughs> He had a rough night, but he did awesome. <laughs> he, did have a rough night. he had a rough night with the kids. Um, okay, so next um, in our agenda, do we have any trustee reports? Okay, so um, I just have two things that I want to say um, as as president, and it is uh, school board recognition. I just want to say to Dr. Reich, to David Wilbanks, to Melody Fowler, to Bowie Hogg to Sarah McMurrah and to Justin Chapa. Thank y'all very much for your leadership and your commitment to our students, the staff, our community, and thank you for your dedication and your hard work for our district. And thank you for, as our students said tonight, for rising above all the challenges that we have as y'all continue to move this uh, district into the future. So just as honored as I am to serve as, as president, I just want to verbally say, Thank y'all very much. Okay, and then the other thing that I wanted to say is, as Pastor Jones said, um, MLK celebrations that we normally have over our four-day period have been postponed, not canceled, but still just remember to take time to um, follow what the theme is, and that is take time to reflect, imagine how you want to see the world, and then work on building the future that way. Okay, that's my report. Uh, Ms. Secretary, do we have any items to consider? Um, Madam President, I think the only one was Mr. Chapa, and he uh, had a question on the compensation when teachers sub uh, wanted to know the amount that they received. Okay. Thank you very much. So it is 1039, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.